Hey guys, brand new podcast, and I am so excited to have this guy on the podcast. He is an absolute legend. It's Boss Rutten, but first, let me tell you, Top Soft World Tour is coming to an end. We have one weekend left. It's Charleston, Lexington, Detroit, and Cleveland. And then Auckland and Wellington, New Zealand, April 17th and 19th. Australia sold out. Top Soft World Tour is done. And we are leaning in to Fully Loaded, baby. Forest Hills, Baltimore, Moosick. Guilford, Traverse City, Fort Wayne, St. Louis, Lincoln, my wife just rolled in, Huntsville, New Orleans, Memphis, Oklahoma City, Las Vegas, Salt Lake City, Boise, and Quincy at the Gorge in Washington. Watch my movie, The Machine, Memorial Day weekend. Go to themachine.movie to get your tickets. Fuck it, let's start the podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, he is a fucking legend. He's one of the best storytellers out there. He is legit, I mean, one of the toughest dudes in the world. It was an absolute honor to have him on the podcast. I've heard him murder on Rogan so many times. I'm milking this for a second because it is my honor and privilege today to have on the Birdcast, Boss Rudin. It's so funny, I never thought of you as a beer drinker. Oh, yeah, big beer drinker. I used to be freaking going crazy. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, Dutch, you're Dutch, right? Dutch, yes. Yeah, I always get, I get confused in that area. We were just over there. We did, uh, uh, we did Amsterdam, Antwerp, uh, and then we did all of Scandinavia. Oh, wow. Yeah. Belgium also. Yeah. I used to live close to the border there. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, you grew up in like a village. I always wonder what that's like. Like, is it like the proper village that like we imagine Americans imagine it to yeah. be a village, or is it pretty... sixty thousand people? At oh, the that's time, pretty big. Is, yeah, but so it was a little, you know, Falcon Town. You that would be the direct translation, I guess. They did used to have like these uh, Falcon shows, whatever they did. Yeah. But it's very close to the Belgian border. We would go to Belgium to drink Stella Artois because that wasn't big at the time, but we loved that beer better than Heineken at the time. Yeah, and they have no closing times in uh, in uh, Belgium. Yeah, so you can party twenty four seven there. Which nice. Dutch dudes are were always like uh were always like rattlesnakes to me. Like when I backpacked through Europe, friendliest fucking guys, and then a couple beers, it was like a wild man was, <laughs> Oh shit. Yeah. I, like that was my only takeaway. Gorgeous, like they were always big, long hair, and then a cu- there was this one guy I remember distinctly, him and his buddies, and they're all Dutch dudes, and they were fun, crazy, jump off a rock, do a backflip and grease into the water. And then after a couple beers, one just a little, almost like kids who didn't know how strong they were. You know what I mean? Yeah. Peter Ertz, you know, he's a good buddy of mine. He's a K1 champion, 3-1 K1, one of the greatest kickboxers ever. That guy still goes strong. Really? Like, and he's my age. He's like, well, he's 53. But, dude, that's in- insanity. And he looks better than when he was competing. Yeah. I go like, man, that's a promotion for drugs and for alcohol, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> right there, right? <laughs> so was, Am- was Amsterdam like kind of something you guys didn't even mess around with? You're like, ah, why go to Amsterdam? No, no, not that much. You know, it's a funny story about Amsterdam because we didn't go a lot. But then when I met my wife, and this is a true story. It's very funny. We decided to go like, uh, once I started fighting, we say, hey, let's go to Amsterdam one time. Check out the red light district because it's like a happening thing. You know? yeah. And we go there and we're walking on the street and suddenly the prostitutes start knocking on the window. I say, hey, boss. <laughs> and I'm walking with my new wife. Yeah. And I look at her, I go, I have, I swear, <laughs> I really, I swear. I try to explain that it's yeah. very hard. But what I re- didn't realize is that my second fight in Japan, I brought another Dutch guy, and he, he's a pimp. And in the hall, it's legal, right? I yeah. think it's legal. And he was fighting on the same show. So he came back with all the magazines, and he said, hey, this is my buddy, boss. He told all these women. But now I'm walking there with her, and they're pointing at me and cheering at me. So, yeah, that was a very hard thing to explain. I still don't know if she still believes it right now. I don't know. You are one of my favorite Rogan guests ever. I, I oh. could listen to you tell stories. You, the way you tell a story is so seamless. <clears throat> So fun. I, I all I remember was one night I was I was in a hotel room bed. I would used to listen to Rogan and like let it play on repeat, you know, just run down the list. Yeah, yeah. And you told a story about a friend who bet he could put a cue ball in his mouth at a bar. Oh, gee. Yeah. And uh you guys had to break his teeth out to get they the ball. The wall. We didn't break it out, somebody else had to. I mean the stupidity that we did, right? I mean it's bizarre. <laughs> like if you if you're pressing against your mouth and you go, I, I think I got it, I think I can put it in, you know, like with that kind of power. Who doesn't think about it? probably alcohol, right? Yeah. 
Who doesn't think about, wait, 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 how am I going to get this thing out? Yeah. Oh, Bosh, you can break my jaw. Yeah, well, I could, but can you imagine? You that would have been better, jaw. I think, actually, to, to break the jaw. And to break the teeth. At least, oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. Because, I mean, break the teeth. Yeah. You, so, you have such a casualness that you tell stories. Like, uh, every bar fight you ever have. I almost got into a fight uh, five minutes ago. Where? In front of this house. Oh, really? Yeah, and, oh, and, I was standing across the street. That would have been great if somebody would have um, done it. I would have spread it over. Oh, I would have fucking... It would have been fun. <clears throat> the guy was such an <laughs> asshole. I was trying to pull into the park, into the into the driveway, and he was walking really slow, and he actually slowed down to walk in front of me. Oh, that was And I was going to honk. Yeah. But I've been in that situation before, and, I, and I, here's the thing I know, is that I think you've heard, I've heard you say this, uh, I I don't know if he can fight, but I know I can't fight. Yeah. <laughs> I know I can't fight. Like, I've never, uh, the last fight I was in was probably in college. And I just, and I always got beat up. I always got, <laughs> okay. I never, it happened oh, so quick. It get worse at least. Yeah, it's, yeah it's, it's, I, I listen to stories of you tell about, like, uh, about getting bullied and then and then realizing those guys, you know, that you, you knowing just a little bit of what to do was such a game changer. Oh, yeah. That I go, oh, if this guy knows anything, he's walking like he knows something. So I should just take those cards and be like, well, I know that he's walking like he knows something, and I know that I'm driving like I don't. Yeah, but those people, I don't know what's wrong with these people. They do that on purpose. You know, they see you coming, and then they have to slide. And most of the time, you know, it's based on what kind of car do I drive? A Mercedes. See, I was going to say, it's either BMW or Mercedes, yeah. because then people go, oh, it's one of the Mercedes. Somehow you have that picture. I don't know why that is, and then they start walking slower. I don't know. Yeah. It's an insecurity, I guess. I don't was, know. Was that first fight when, when you were being bullied as a kid, right after you had learned Taekwondo, that was your first fist fight? First fist fight, which was weird, actually, because I, I Taekwondo was kicking, right? Yeah. But I knocked him out with a one punch, and that was it. And that's, till this day, it's still one of my favorite fights, of course, because it was a, dra it was a drama thing, you know? So I was riding my bicycle and then they say hey leper i was the leper in school right yeah. watch out your ears don't fall off something they shouted this time i shouted something back and i'm looking and i see them laugh and they started to chase me and then i go you know what i'm gonna i'm not gonna do this anymore so i put the, my bike on the stand and i waited for them and they surrounded me with their bikes and i always say like in the movies they have the cars in the middle yeah. of the night with the shine the lights and they're yeah. the lighting for the fight but this was kids you know and then he started bouncing his chest against my chest and, and they were then, older than you right and they were older than me and then I, you know you want to hit me i go sure and that was it one punch i was amazed and then i realized wait a minute this is much easier than i thought it was <laughs> And then I start going after everybody. I thought this was gonna be a nightmare. I made a list. I made a list of all the bullies. Really? Yeah. And everybody who got in school who got bullied, I took care of that as well. I became the bully guy. Every new school I went to, first day there were fights because really? people tried me out, you know. And then I started. Yeah. That's it's so fascinating to see, because I only know you from, and I wasn't watching live then. I I, I met you. It's gonna sound insane, but I think I met you with Kevin James. Oh, that's a right. long that's time right. ago, I was good friends with his brother Gary. Okay, and I think Kevin was watching maybe UFC or or one of the fights over at his house. Remember and the uh, Santa Monica house or which house? The Santa Monica house. Yeah, with yeah, the, yeah. We had remember he had the he had the first HD television yeah, I yeah, ever yeah, saw. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was like twenty five thousand dollars. He'd done something for the Super Bowl and gotten it. I think. Yeah, he had, he was also the movie theater in there. Also, that yeah. was the first time I saw in a house because I was young early yeah. on here in America a movie theater in your house. I go, wow, who's got yeah. a movie theater? So, and I remember uh, Gary told me I don't think I don't know if we met or I don't I don't remember, but I remember it's the first time I heard your name. And I was like, oh, wow. And then, but I, I, I have since watched uh, so many of your fights, so the, the Pancras fights. Oh, yeah. Those fights are insane. And I'm curious what, how, how, what, was the, what was it like that got you from being bullied for that first fight to get you to there? You know, it's, it's really weird. Like, for instance, in Thai boxing, I, for, first I went from Thai boxing, okay? And that's really big in the in Netherlands. Holland. Oh, yeah, in yeah. Holland. we got the best guys in the world. You know, and why is that? I have no clue. I think it is because Jan Plas, Johan Vos, those were these guys from Rob Kamen and Ernesto Hoos, and all these guys, they, they were ahead of the times, uh, of the time, and they went to Thailand, got their butts handed to them, and then they went back and they said, wait a minute, they predominantly kick. What if we add Western boxing to our repertoire, right? And then we wrap it up with kicks. Yeah. And that was it. And they start going there and they start beating the guys. I was one time we did a show, or they did a show, and I was there. 
in the Jaap Edehal, famous place in Holland for uh, fights. And there were four world title fights, which was broadcasted live to Thailand. And all the ties got knocked out. They never did it again because really? yeah, it was such an embarrassment for them. It was an embarrassment. Yeah. I never got that when people lose. It's you lose, right? You win, lose. What is? So I don't know. This that's it. I guess those guys were the guys who started this whole thing, tying the Western boxing together with the knees and the kicks. And but being Dutch what, kickboxing was born. What was was are the are the are the boss rooting bar fight stories before pan pancreas um, and before the tie boxing? Or during? During, I would say. Like the big one in Sweden, that was that was in 2000, so that was afterwards. They knew me. Uh, that was actually my last one also. What, uh, your, your last bar fight? Last bar fight, What yeah. was the Sweden one? Oh, that's a story on Joe Rogan. I said with the five bounces, the mafia. The oh, Greek. they they walked you down like it was. If like I, remember, I remember staircase. hearing it, and it was like in an alley or something. Yeah, like the, the fire stairs escape with like a marble big stairs going down, and it was freaking insanity. And uh, the problem was one of them was a cop. So it started, they push me in between two doors and they say, you have to leave. And I knew right away, I said, this is going to go wrong. So I said, okay, no problem. <clears throat> I said, can you do me a favor though? I have a friend of mine here. He's also bald, he's from Holland. Can you tell him I'm outside? Because otherwise he doesn't. He says, you don't understand me. And I go, whoa, 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 dude, relax. No problem here. I said, I'm going. I'm just trying to get, you know, look out for my buddy. And he says, you need to go. I say, you need to stop pushing me. There is no need for any pushing. I'm going. I don't want any trouble. And then the guy behind him jumped over him. And he was a big guy. And he stepped his finger in my eye. I go, dude, what are you doing? And then right away in my other eye. Yeah, and then you're thinking, what is next, right? Yeah. So I knocked him out. Boof. And I remember when he went down, it was the wildest thing. Because the music was still going. And I heard, Ugh! like a very weird freaking sound and I'm looking down and his face is already like freaking bowled up. Now that guy woke up the whole time and he kept going after my eyes because there's moments in the fight that you, this is really weird because you go like, dude, eventually I'm going to lose this thing. You know, there's five guys. I mean, yeah. they wake up the whole time. I'm knocking them out, but they're, while they're fighting other guys, they're waking back up again. It's like crazy. One of them was a cop, which I didn't know. Of course, if he attacks me, I'll knock him out. Yeah. Right. So that's why they wanted to keep me there for yeah, six yeah, to nine yeah, months. Yeah. Dude, it was insanity. And then I uh, realized, maybe I play that. I go, no, no, I can't play that because if I play that, then the guy with the eyes, he's going to really do a hurt. Walking down and for some way there was a, was a hole in the wall with a little fans or cake. I don't, it's really weird, with broomsticks. And I'm falling against it and I'm grabbing a broomstick and I go, no, because if I do it, then they gonna grab one. That yeah. was my thinking. Yeah. Well, I left it, but they all grabbed one of yeah. those. And now I had the broomsticks after me. So I'm, you should have seen the picture the next day. They, they put me in the, in the newspapers also. Uh, the story from them, it was cool because my, my street fighting DVD sales, they went up in Sweden yeah. because this was in Sweden and they were known as the mafia bounce, really bad guys. And they would do this to everybody. And they put the picture of my, my street fighting DVD on the, on the, on the newspaper. And then the, the guard said, we were very happy the police came. We couldn't handle him. And I go, whoa. And that then is the sales, marketing 101. That was marketing 101, yeah. But then I got to jail. Uh, and they wanted to keep me there six to nine months. And I go, they started this thing, you know? Yeah. And they go, like, yeah, no, they say you started. I go, they got all the, yeah, they were bothering a guy. The guy was buying me a drink. That's literally what, that's when they took me away. They say, oh, you're bothering the customer. I said, the one that you're, he's buying a drink for me right now. What, what's going on? But I knew when I walked in, it was already something wrong because they said, they called me by my name. And they said, hey, boss, you keep it calm tonight, right? And I go, that's a weird thing to say. Yeah, so and they my, had an eye on you. An eye on me already. And I was meant, um, I could, just called my wife and I was drunk, I remember. And she says, why are you laughing? I said, well, I'm just having a good time, you know, I'm just uh, happy and I'm drunk, you know me. She says, no, 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 you're there because uh, you got two Swedish blood girls, aren't you? I go, honey, I'm just drunk, don't worry about it. Yeah. Two days after I'm in jail, they uh, finally allow me to make my first phone call. Oh, which, by the way, up. Yeah. So, which, by the way, was in a regular jail. They brought me from the police station two days later into a freaking mountain. Dude, it's, do I, and I looked it up, it's real. You go into a mountain and then the, the mountain stops, the, the tunnel stops. You go out, take an elevator, fourth floor up, another elevator, two down, another elevator, three up. And I go, dude, this is like a movie. I had no clue what was going on. Yeah. But then the guards came and they knew me. I got my own cell. I got coffee, cookies. They can play cards with me. And then guys, I go, dude, I need to make a phone call to my wife. And uh, the guard gives me a cell phone. I got a call with this phone. I said, oh, thank you, man. So I called my wife. She's freaking out now by now because she has no clue what's going on. Yeah. 
And I go, honey, you slowed out. I don't have a lot of time. I say, what do I want to hear first? The good or the bad story? And she says, the good story. I say, I didn't have sex with two Swedish girls. <laughs> and she goes, what's the bad one? I say, I'm in jail. And they're talking about six to nine months. I don't know. You know, why are you crazy? You think that's funny? I go, yeah. I thought that yeah. was a funny moment. <laughs> and that was it. And then thankfully I had some friends who are pretty powerful friends and they talked to those guys and they took the charges back and then they threw me out of jail, so. Have you ever run into someone you've gotten in a fight with, in like a bar fight after the fact, like a couple years later? Dude, I have the craziest story for that. That's so funny that you asked that. So, oh, okay, what's this? So I'm I'm doing this uh, security thing in a, in a pool cafe from a friend of mine. Yeah. It's very close to my house, like a mile and a half away from my house. I never have to be there because if there's a problem, they pick up the phone and I'm driving over and everything's gonna be okay. So it's, I don't know if this was Christmas because I have a lot of stories there. <laughs> <laughs> because a whole bunch of fight stories. But anyway, my, my wife and I are there. And Karen, she comes over to me and she says, I think you need to warm up. And I go, why? I says, well, that bodybuilder <laughs> over there, <laughs> yeah, he told me he's going to grab a chair and he's going to slam it in my face. I go, which guy? That guy. I go, okay. So I go over to the guy, giant guy. A lot of muscles, not big tall, but freaking big. So I go and say, dude, uh, did you just tell my wife you're gonna hit a chair on his face? And he's talking to two ladies and he goes, ladies, one moment I got some business to take care of. And suddenly he goes down, he grabs the bar stool and he lifts it above his head. Yeah, there's no defense now, right? Yeah, so yeah. I go, boom, <laughs> guy goes down, grab his head, knee him against the bar, bar breaks, teeth flying. This guy's out and they go to the ambulance and. Anyway, my wife the next day, she's taking a driver's classes and a driver instruct, driving instructor doesn't show up. And she's waiting, she's waiting. And finally the guy shows up, he comes in his car and he's sweating and, and my wife was going on. She said, well, uh, I have a crazy son. He's always in street fights, you know, he, he, he got the wrong guy yesterday. I mean, teeth out of his mouth, the skull, you know, and he's in the, <laughs> in the hospital right now. My wife said, <laughs> oh shit, that's probably the guy. So now three years later, we're doing, uh, it's it's New Year's Eve, and we're outside and a friend of mine, that, that's why we do the fireworks, New yeah. Year's Eve. Yeah. They brought a bomb, C4, plastics. I go, <laughs> put me in coach, I, I, wanna, I wanna detonate a bomb. I never detonated a bomb, right? I mean, I really wanted to do it. So they said, okay, it's cool. So they gave me the plastic and they put the cables in it. There's like 10 feet of wire. Yeah. I go, we're gonna need more wire, you know? I mean, this thing, it's gonna make a bomb. So this guy taps me on my shoulder. He says, hey, you need more wire? I say, yeah, go with me. So we run to his car and he opens the car and he starts ripping out his speaker cables. I go, do, 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 don't, don't. You know, you're drunk right now. You're going to hate yourself tomorrow morning. He said, no, 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 no. I want to see you, you detonating the bomb. I go, okay, dude, if you want, we'll pull it out. He says, yeah, you don't recognize me, right? <laughs> I go, no. He says, you beat all my teeth out here like uh, three years ago. I go, dude, that was you. You were... You were so big. He goes, yeah, I was losing a lot of steroids at the time. I was a very angry person, but you kind of put me in place. Oh, and this is when I stopped using steroids. Up. Yeah, it was the wildest story ever. That's so crazy. his father's teaching my wife. It's insanity, right? That's insane. Yeah. That bar, it's a crazy bar. You're, have, you, have you ever thought about writing a book? Yeah, we did. Now, now I'm doing, now I'm thinking about it. Because you're a really entrepreneurial guy. Like you had your Street Fight DVDs. Yeah. That were huge. I remember, I remember the first time I heard you on Rogan, you were talking about them. I think. Yeah. And I was, and it was like, and and I, I always was like, what is the number one thing you could tell a guy like me if you like? Because sometimes, sometimes you'll say something like today is a perfect example. I wanted to honk at the guy. I chose not to. Yeah. But there have been times in my life where I've said things to the wrong guy. Yeah. What's the number one thing? Like, is, is the old adage like my? I think my uncles or my dad told me. You punt, You throw the first punch. Never let them throw the first punch. Mm, yeah, depends who you are. Like it's, it's, I always think there's cameras. Yeah. So I will talk to them under, I keep my voice and so it, it depends upon them because they need to throw the first punch. Yeah, yeah for you, <laughs> you know, yeah. yeah. So, 
for you, yeah, if you really think, if he puts his hands up, you can already throw because that's, he wants to fight, you know, yeah. so that you are legally, that you can punch. Yes, and, and it's all about distance. It's all about, but it's all about controlling your emotions as well. You know, most of the time when you're too angry and you close the distance too fast, and the head is here, for instance, but you're closing the distance, now the head is here, so you can't really punch because you don't have any load up. Yeah. And that's what anger does and emotions do. But if you just learn one punch, I can teach you very uh, across, and I can teach you where the power comes from. That you get it in one minute. They always say, "Oh, it comes from the floor." What does that mean? You know, yeah. well, how does that power from the floor get you there? Well, I will tell you exactly how it works. And once I put that picture in your mind, you go, "Oh, okay, this is easy." Because now, if you use that, you know, then your cross is always going to be hit, and it's always good to add a left one as well, just for the fact that if you break a right, if you fight multiple guys, you break one hand, yeah. and you at least you got the other hand as well. So it's it's about staying calm, which is very hard if you're never. I want to learn. Before. I want to. I want to learn your liver kick. Oh yeah, that's, your liver kick is. Your leg is. <laughs> I mean, I, it, it is. Well, that's the thing is like I, what I what I, I kept thinking every time I've seen you fight, you're you have such you have such amazing range of motion. You have such amazing power in your legs, and those liver kicks look fucking insanely painful yeah i have a different stance that a lot of people have i i would always look at a guy like mike tyson and i go why can't he generate so much power in both his hands and it's because he has an open stance everybody's blading right they're like yeah. the, the boxers and he's open but that gives him way more power on his left i go wait a minute is that gonna work in fighting too and then robin decker's one of the greatest tie boxers ever he unfortunately passed away he's a good friend of mine i trained at his gym all the way back because he was the the, the master of the livers i mean that guy would drop ties with liver shots really? uh, yeah it was insanity that's why i wanted to know the liver shot and the fact that i got dropped on a liver shot my very first tie boxing class has something to do with it as well <laughs> because i thought i was a badass yeah but the, and the pro guy figured me out really fast well that's why i think oh. every person's thinking about their head yeah but all, uh, but that kick is fucking insane. Do you put your toe into it? No, I kick with the instep. I try to do the instep. Preferably, I kick with the shin, you know, uh, because, the, and especially on the street, you know, you never, because if you hit an elbow with your instep, that could be a problem if you break your foot, one of oh, the yeah. bones, you know, it's, it's just annoying. You got to have to keep on fighting. You know, in MMA with leg locks, you don't want to get, get your foot get hold with that, yeah. so... Yeah, no, it's just doing it a lot. That it's just very basic stuff. And some guys, they they really listen, and they go, "Why is no anybody explaining it like this? <clears throat> it's so easy." I have this guy, Gabriel Basso. He's got his own show now on Netflix and an, an FBI show. Yeah. This guy's an amazing drummer. He's an amazing artist. He's a, he can do anything, you know. And you go, I, he came to train. I mean, four months later, he fights a guy who's seven and zero. Really? And it just cripples the guy. Wait, what show does he have on Netflix? Oh, Did I, I see this guy fight? No, it, it's going to come out. I think also the 17th about this month. It's, oh, yeah? it's, it's, your, your thing is going to be released on the 17th. My, 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 my special comes out March 14th. Yeah, Razzle Dazzle. Razzle Dazzle. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. But he, I think he's just promoting. Someone isolate that audio. You saying Razzle Dazzle. <laughs> oh, stop it. Yeah, he's going to, he's going to. Uh, he's going. I think he's going. His show is going to start around that time as well. Oh, nice! So he's going to do all the freaking bucket press. Bucket well, that, that's how I knew. I knew of you mostly. This sounds crazy, but mostly of, of as like a, almost like a a trainer because you trained Kevin. You got Kevin in good shape. Yeah, and you uh, and the one thing not to deviate from me talking about Pancras. I want to talk about those fights. I want to talk about how you got there. But one of the things you did that I was obsessed with was, because uh, I have asthma. And so mine's allergy induced, but- um, Me too. You too? Yeah, it's, it's both, I have a both. I take a sprint and then I wait a minute and then it, well, not anymore, of course, because this, I, I came up with an, I, a, an idea for that, yeah. Wait, so t wait <coughs> hang on, talk about that because I always felt <coughs> like, I always felt, this is the dumbest thing in the world, but I always felt like I could, I could, I could fix my asthma by working out, or yeah. I could fix my asthma by training my lungs or getting them. So if I had an asthma attack, I would get on our treadmill, and I would run, yeah. and I would try to push through it, and go. I'll get. I'm gonna get air into my lungs. Yeah. Um, and then I heard you on Rogan. I don't know if this is the same thing, but I heard you on Rogan, and you had a breath control device. Yeah. That you were using to for training purposes. I think you were using it because you said it was like having asthma, right? But so, yeah. <clears throat> so I was a severe asthma patient, meaning every five weeks I had an attack, weak in bed, not even able 
able to eat. For real? Yeah. And I'd get it with that with an eczema, like, which was horrible because I looked like a leper. It was really bad. I would make a face. And this is when you were a kid. When I was a kid. <laughs> but I would also do track and field at a high level. I wanted to become the next Bruce Jenner, believe it or not, the, the Dutch Bruce Jenner, because he was decathlon, 1976 gold medalist. I mean, the guy's stud. And, um, but, but needless to say, 400 meters, 800 meters, 1500 meters, really bad for me because of my asthma. If I had an asthma attack, though, for a week in bed, and I restarted my track and field, I would always break my running times. And it drove me insane. And then I go, what is this? Is the, the, maybe I'm taking the medication or whatever it is. It's got to be something like that. Until I went to the doctor and I saw a drawing of a pair of lungs on the wall. And it showed the infection is not in your lungs. The infection is in the airways going to the lungs. And it showed an infected airway and it showed a healthy airway. And I go, that's it. I was 14. And then that's when I came up with the idea. I go, dude, I've been, I've been pulling air in through an infected area. I've been working out my lungs with yeah. resistance yeah. for a week straight, 24-7. And then after that's gone, now they're much stronger. It's easy for them to pull air in. That's why I break my running times. Why don't I come up with something? Why don't I have my keys on me? Because I have a washer on my key chain as a friendly reminder. I used to do, you put washers in front of my teeth with little holes going smaller and smaller and smaller yeah. to, to mimic that effect. And that was it. That was the idea. And then many years later, I made it and not realizing it's an inspiratory muscle to not realizing also that your lungs don't do anything. Your lungs are just two bags. There's, there's no muscle in a lung. Yeah. The only way for you to open up your lungs is by chest expansion, which happens by your diaphragm and your intercostals, which are the muscles in between your ribs. So if you expand your chest, that is how you pull air in. Your chest doesn't expect because you put air in them. It's the other way around. It's really weird if you think about it. It's a really weird concept. But your breathing muscle is getting really, really strong. And I started training with it for three weeks. Listen, I use an inhaler in every <clears throat> fight I had in my life, everywhere. I brought it with me, always in my pocket. I sneezed violently three times, lungs closed, I have to open them up. Really? Three weeks with that prototype of the O2 trainer, my asthma is gone. I don't even have one anymore. Don't, not at home, nothing. I know that I know that panic of not having oh, an it's, asthma inhaler. It's the worst. It's the worst, especially if you're doing mushrooms or, oh. or like, like, <laughs> like, <laughs> well, you like, go bad. <laughs> well, yeah. we were at the football, we went to the, to the uh, Super Bowl. <laughs> And we had these blunts, and I was like, I'm going to smoke a blunt, but I'm going to grab an asthma inhaler just in case. I should be fine. I haven't had an attack in forever. And I couldn't find my asthma inhaler, and I said, this is going to fuck me up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is going to fuck me up mentally. And so, and there's like, by the way, there are, anyone with asthma knows that feeling of going like, well, shit. Like, if I'm going out, I want to make sure I have it in my pocket. 100%, yeah. Yeah. But when I saw you talk about this on Rogan, I was like, I bet that fucking works. That's the way my brain works. I brought one for you. Are you being serious? hundred percent. Yeah, I brought one for you. I, I, it's in my uh, wife's bag. They're sitting down. Says, but yeah, for sure. You, you, hundred percent. It works. Oh yeah. I mean, the reviews that we have is bizarre. We have the number one choice on Amazon right now. We beat everybody else. It's, hey, it's pulled going up, real pull, well. We pulled up. Uh, Halston pulled up a picture of the O2 trainer. So yeah. So because I used to watch. There was a guy, Dave Navarro. Do you remember him from uh, uh, from? Uh, Chain's addiction. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Dave Navarro just used to work for... out in a in a hyperbaric chamber. Yeah, is, is that what's it? Is it no? They they make it so you're working out at altitude. Altitude, yeah. And it, and I thought, well, that's roughly the same thing. Working out at altitude. Mm, no, because so when you do altitude, high altitude training, that's good for more red blood cells in your body. In your oh, blood. is that what it is? Yep. But you don't strengthen your breathing muscles. You cannot strengthen your breathing muscles other than use an inspiratory muscle training device, which is what this thing is. It's crazy. The, you can go on published medical journals. I have it on my website back because people are like, oh, it's a gimmick. Okay, well, I got like 1,500 published medical journals backing everything up. So yeah. that, it's not a gimmick at all. So, But it's once you understand how you breathe and you make your breathing muscles stronger, dude, it, 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 it's going to work. The one thing that... You breathe actually better than a regular person. 95% already for the people breathe incorrect. I was breathing incorrect using your raising your shoulders, yeah. right? Uh, have you said, guys, what you say, you know? Yeah. Because you have to carry that weight up so you don't. You automatically breathe already more diaphragmatic. Yeah. But I guarantee you, if you start training those muscles, you, uh, you, you it's going to go away. Really? Yeah. I have a 30-day thing. I say 70% or more gone in 30 days. If not, oh. I give you money back. I'm getting on the treadmill today yeah. with it. I'm getting on the treadmill with it today. Look at that giant guy. He's got a really good breath, actually. He's, that guy's he's a, a massive man. Massive dude. When what he walked into the gym, all my, all my students went like, who is that guy? Dog. This episode is brought to you by Manscaped. And what a perfect time, considering April, is Testicular Cancer Awareness Month to help raise awareness 
and to fundraise for a good cause. The leaders in Below the Waist Grooming have partnered with the Testicular Cancer Society to remind you to check your golden nuggets this month for anything not so golden. And while you're down there, shave your balls to save your balls. Support a good cause and go to manscaped.com and use the code BERT to get 20% off plus free shipping since April is National Testicular Cancer Awareness Month. I want to take a second to talk about men's health issues that are important to me. Did you know one guy every hour, every day is diagnosed with testicular cancer? You know, I thought I had testicular cancer once. I swear to God, it's a, it, you got to check your nuts. So this is a reminder to all men listening, check yourselves. Manscaped, in addition to providing the right tools and solutions for safe and easy manscaping, has partnered with Testicular Cancer Society to spread awareness for men's health and early cancer detection. It makes sense, right? We use Manscaped products daily to trim and maintain that region below the waist. While you're down there cleaning up your sack, why not go ahead and give them a little investigation for lumps, changes in size, anything, any pain. I'm telling you right now, I think we can all agree it's pretty fun playing with your balls anyway, right? Together, we save balls. Get it? To help remind you guys to check themselves for testicular cancer for a limited time only, you can get their new special edition purple TCS lawnmower 4.0 electric waterproof trimmer. The special edition is a collectible item. There are only 10,000 units in existence, so make sure to get yours today while supplies last. Once they're gone, they're gone. By the way, I have mine. I opened it, and I was like, oh, is this from a supervillain? It looks badass. With the launch of their special edition Lawnmower 4.0 Purple Trimmer, Manscaped will be donating $50,000 to their longtime partner, the Testicular Cancer Society, to help those impacted by testicular cancer. Let me say this real quick, gentlemen, if you're listening. Early detection is the key to saving your life. I have had a number of friends with testicular cancer, and they've all beat it. All of them have beat it, but they found it early. They talked to a doctor. Gentlemen, do this today. I'm telling you right now. Get 20% off plus free shipping with the code BERT at manscaped.com. That's 20% off plus free shipping with the code BERT at manscaped.com. Make sure to spread the news and tell your buddies to check themselves in Testicular Awareness Month. We are supported by Black Buffalo. I love tobacco. I love chewing. I love dipping. It was such an important part of my life when I was younger. I mean, I can't imagine having a story told without it. And on the bus these days, I I can't help it. If you're 21 and over and you dip or chew pouches or long cut, check out the award-winning tobacco alternative, Black Buffalo. Black Buffalo is everything you love, nothing you don't. The feel, the taste, the ritual, just without the actual tobacco leaf or stem. Black Buffalo is actually made from a variety of green leaves in the cabbage family. You take pride in what you do. Take pride in what you dip. Honor your rituals and do it with Black Buffalo. Black Buffalo makes all the best flavors like wintergreen, mint, straight, peach, and even blood orange. And with and without pharmaceutical grade nicotine. You can also buy Black Buffalo at thousands of retail locations around the country like AM, PM, by checking their store locator on their website. I'm telling you right now, for me, half of the ritual is the smell. You open a can of Black Buffalo and you smell that wintergreen and you're like, I'm there, baby. That's all you really need. If you're 21 and over and use products like this, it's time to join the Black Buffalo herd. Head to blackbuffalo.com and use the promo code BERT at checkout for 15% off your first order. Use my code BERT for 15% off your first order one last time. That's promo code BERT for 15% off your order. Warning, this product contains nicotine. Nicotine is an addictive chemical. How did you come up with all your training stuff? Because I've watched a bunch of your videos. I've watched probably an abnormal amount of your videos. (laughs) And even when you talk about, uh, one of my favorite quotes is, uh, fatigue makes cowards of us all. It's by Jimmy Johnson. And you have a quote very similar as that, so you were saying guys of the same level. Yeah. The only thing that makes a difference is training. Is 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 uh it's part of muscle training. Uh, yeah, yeah. And just and who can who can keep pushing the pace the faster the longer? The, that's gonna who's win. gonna win. Yeah, it's always like that. And you know, and, and with this also, we, we don't work out these breathing muscles. And I always explain imagine you have two clones, right? Two brothers, yeah. identical in everything. 
uh, fingerprints. Yeah. Everything's identical. So DNA, whatever. And they decide to, to, to have a, a, a triathlon against each other. And they say they bring in the, uh, the, the swimming coach and they sit in front of them. They get the same information at the same time. The cycling coach and the running coach comes in. Same information, same food, same ink, same sleep. Do everything the same. One of them trains his breathing muscles though. Who's going to win? And there you have your answer, you know, because yeah. gassing, what gassing is, if you start gassing, that is literally your body pulling all the blood away from your limbs that you're using. And they go like, whoa, 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 that's not true. Of course it's true because it sends it to your breathing muscles since those are the number one priority in your body. Yeah. Because if you don't breathe for three, four minutes, you're dead. So if you're running a hill and you start gassing, that is they take all the oxygenated blood away from your legs, send it to your breathing muscles. If you update those breathing muscles, your gassing, instead of starting here, will start there. And that's the big difference. Now, when did you come up with this? When did you come up with this? 14. I was 14 years old. <laughs> yeah, that's what, why I, I what was- What would a... you, like, what, just out of curiosity, say you had never taken that Taekwondo <laughs> class. Yeah. Where do you think, what, what do you think would have happened to you? Yeah, I have no clue. It's so weird, right? But everything is weird because, you know, free fighting, it's what they call it. I had a phone that I never picked up and the answering machine was broke and somehow- I picked up the phone and the guy goes, jump in your car right now, comes to Amsterdam, come to Amsterdam. There's this new organization, Pancras. They're looking for fighters. I think you could be good in that. And I went over there, got in a scuffle with one of his guys. He tried to knock me outside, knocked him out. And boom, I had the job. You see, but it, what if I didn't pick up that phone call? Why did Wait, I pick up the phone call? What year is this, like 93, 94? That was in 92 even, yeah, all the way back. Well, maybe not, just 93, because I think I was fighting my first fight within three months of that. So wait, okay, so get me to, get me to, you get bullied, you take Taekwondo. I know a lot of your story. I know a lot of your story because I've listened to every Rogan you've ever done and I've listened <laughs> to other podcasts. You're just such a great storyteller. So, I and, and I don't want to take away from you telling these stories, but I don't want you to feel like you have to tell the same stories again. Yeah, yeah. Um, you get bullied, your parents pull you out because you got, you break the guy's nose. Yep. And you, and they don't let you do fighting, but that, I think that not letting you do fighting is what made you so passionate about fighting. Oh yeah. Cuz because when you take something away from someone, you want it, even more. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's what happened, you know, because I started going to to uh, what is it? Book, uh, libraries and yeah. all that stuff and reading books and getting video cassettes and Bruce Lee and stop mimicking people and I say, hey, this is good. Maybe I can do this as well. People thought I was a black belt at the time already, but I just learned from pictures. And then at 20, I moved out of the house. I started Thai boxing right away. Competing in Thai boxing went really well. I didn't have the control yet at that time. You know, I was still a dojo fighter is what we call it as fighters. What does that mean? <clears throat> that means you're really good in the dojo, but under pressure, you know, because of the pressure, you freaking go crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I didn't have the control. And that control, So, but I was very physically strong, so I knocked a lot of guys out. Did you? Were you lifting weights at the time? No, I did weights before because we wanted to be Schwarzenegger and all that kind of stuff. But uh, yeah. no, I always believe more in stamina and endurance. I would do weights, lighter weights, 30 repetitions each set, like a lot yeah. of repetitions with a little less weight. And uh, that's it. I started Thai boxing. And from Thai boxing, I went to Japan. Uh, that was the free fighting. And that's when I, the day of the fight, I thought it was weird. There was no weigh-ins. And, and yeah. I know where this is going. Yeah. It's freaking crazy. So the next day I go, well, I guess they're very, they're honest. The Japanese are known for being honest people. Yeah. So he'll probably use my weight. Wait a minute. Did we talk about a weight? You know, so I'm <laughs> I love, I love small realizations. Yeah. Where you're laying in bed the night before the fight, you go, wait, they don't know how much I weigh. I, I didn't even know the rules. I didn't yeah. know anything. And I go like, this will be explained to us, right? So the next day, this How old are you at this point? Uh, 28. 28, yeah. Tall Japanese guy walks up to me. I thought he's the promoter. I say, hey, very nice meeting you. I said, see the promoter. He goes, no, I'm fighting you. I go, you're fighting me. I go, what's your weight? And he was like, 238 or something. And I was like, uh, 201 or something. Yeah. <laughs> so I go, I, aren't you not too uh, heavy? And then the promoter walked up and I go, hey, I said, you're the promoter? Yeah, nice. I said, well, what's going on with the weight? He said, oh no, Mr. Ruth, there's no weight classes. I said, no weight classes? Yeah, I go. So now I'm, I'm acting. I go, wait, wait, okay, good. Yeah, love it. Nice. I love <laughs> so it. So excited. Yeah, good. How many rounds were we fighting? He goes, one. One. Yeah. <laughs> More. How many minutes? He goes, 30. 30. <laughs> and I'm going inside. I'm going, what the heck? 30 freaking minutes. One round, 30 minutes. And the rules in Pancras were 
You could no clothes hand, hand by to the body, to but the body. To, the, to the hat not. And then and uh, and you could have knee, shin guards, right? There was shin guards and shoes, which is horrible. For, these rules were tailor made for the Japanese guys, because they were really good submission guys, really good with leg locks. Yeah. Well, first of all, if the striking is not as good, you put shin guards on. That's going to help them a lot. Yeah. Shoes with leg locks is the worst for the person who's wearing shoes. Yeah. You know, so I think they tailor made that. And then if you grabbed onto a rope, they that, that's like pro wrestling. They couldn't yeah. let him go. But, you know, that's why I thought we had from the small organization, Pancras, I think we had seven UFC champions. Who? Uh, Frank uh, Shamrock. Frank Shamrock, you. Ken Shamrock, Guy Metzger, uh, Maurice Smith, Evan Tanner, uh, myself. I mean, that's already six. Uh, Takahashi fought, but that was not for a title. But all these guys did really well. And, the re and this is what I'm telling everybody. I go, dude, they should start an organization like that again. Because imagine... Normally, <clears throat> I go into a fight, I get somebody in the submission, fight's over. Yeah. This, and now I got to be more strategic. I need to know if I'm close to the ropes or not, because otherwise he can grab the rope. So now sometimes you go, you get him in a submission, he grabs the rope, you're going to have to let go. That's the same as getting an eight count. So after, yeah. if the fight goes the distance, it's the same. Oh, he got an eight, he loses. But now, fight number two starts. So when you look at me, I have on paper, I have 14 submissions and 11 knockouts. But if you look at my, I have 43 submissions or 51 submissions in real life. Yeah. You know, because, so that means I had way more ring time because the fight wasn't over now. Now you could fight again. So for us, all these guys, they were constantly fighting and fighting. I mean, we fought a lot. I fought the first year, I fought eight fights. And the next year, I fought nine fights in one year. So I had 17 fights in two years. Holy you see, cow. because I didn't get injured, I go, might as well keep on fighting then. You'll get better. So that's why I always believe they should bring that back to the close fist, though, because they were waiting for me, man. When I left Pancras, two months later, they did the same rules as everywhere. And they're yeah. like, oh, serious? Yeah. I could never close my fist and no shin guards. That would have been freaking awesome. But unfortunately, that didn't happen for me. Yeah, you, you got the 10,000 work hours. of, And you're right. I remember, <clears throat> I remember uh, the, the idea that you could grab on a rope and get out of a submission was like, Oh, you had to get good. You had, not only you had to be good with submissions, you had to be good with where you had your submissions. That's it. You you need to be very strategical. Now you have to the, the ring control. The, the you need the to, to situational awareness. You know, if this guy is on my in my guard and I want to reverse him, wait a minute. If I reverse him, I'm going to be closer to the rope now. You know, so if I want to go submission, you get oh well at least it's in. The, you see, that's when you can start talking to yourself. Is it okay? If it's not okay, yeah. but if it backfires, you know now I'm. The, you see, so yeah, strategical. You needed to think more, and especially also with your stamina. If you had a thirty-minute fight, oh my god, thirty-minute fight is no one's. <clears throat> that's insane. I fought a twenty-seven one time. First punch, I break my hand. That's from that first punch. Oh my god! On and on that guy that I beat in forty-three seconds in my very first fight. I put him in a scary in a coma for two days. It was a very scary fight. Um, and then after that was actually the guy who came to shake my head. I was really worried. I, I told my wife, I said, "Listen, if he's not going to wake up, that's it. I don't want to do this anymore." Yeah, he's a very friendly guy. He became actually a good friend of mine. And then later we fought one more time, and I broke my hand on the first one. I submitted him five times. I couldn't hit anymore. So uh, that was a twenty-seven minute fight. That's my longest fight ever. Yeah. Holy shit! Yeah, it's crazy. Twenty-seven minutes. That's like, I mean, <clears throat> that just. What was what was your ritual getting ready for a fight? Did you did the, the, did you like like were you <coughs> like nervous? Because you look I, I, whenever you see a video of you coming out into the ring, you look just stoic. Like you look like yeah. I got nothing. And Tom and I, Tom Segura is my. We do a podcast yeah. together called Two Bears, and uh, we were at NASCAR uh, the five hundred Dave Tona five hundred yes two days ago, and I mean the 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 drivers are walking to their cars and. They're like, hey, do you guys want to walk with the drivers? And both Tom and I were like, if this was stand up, I'd be like, leave me the fuck alone. Yeah. And we're literally walking. But still to this day, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Stand yeah. up. Yeah. Yeah. I don't because want. Because you get used to it, right? Well, I'm used to it, but like, like I don't <clears> want to. <throat> I don't want to talk to anyone. I don't want to like be in a group of people. Be talk to like in a yeah, weird yeah. way. I kind of want to be. Yeah, yeah. Of course, because you head. got a lot of dialogue. That <clears> you yeah, have to I'm, I'm thinking about what I want to say and <clears> and. I don't like a lot of energy backstage before a show. I don't like yeah. a lot. I like, I'd rather Me too. be Everything. just, yeah, I don't mind just sitting there having a coffee, maybe talking to my assistant or the other comics. But like if my parents are there, I'm like, fuck, you guys need to go to your seats. Yeah. Like everyone that's backstage before a show, I go, everyone go to your seats. Yep. I'll meet understand. you after the show. We'll hang out after the show. But And we were walking literally with one of the drivers to him to his car. We were walking him yeah. to his car. And he goes, whatever. And we were like, what the fuck? <clears throat> Tom and I were like, we'd be a mess. Yeah. And I was wondering... 
what it was like when you were doing Pancras. Because also, you were doing this at a time where it wasn't, it was on a big stage in Japan. Yeah. And it was, but it wasn't like UFC Today now is so yeah, yeah. fucking here. You were doing it like almost like, like just making sure you could pay bills. Yeah. yeah. It, well, you know, it's, it's, it's trusting yourself. It's first of all, preparation is the key to success, right? If yeah. you go in with, uh, you, you memorize half, everything half, yeah, you're going to be nervous because, yeah. oh, shit, I hope I remember this. That's not a good thing. Same in fighting. If you know you can't go 30 minutes, that's a bad thing, especially if you're a yeah. strong yeah. guy because if you run out of gas, you're going to lose. So preparation is key to success, I always say, and that calms the nerves for a lot. Then there is this moment in the fight, just before the fight, when you stare there, everything's good, and it goes, ping, and at the bell goes, Everything for me is, disappears, yeah. and now I'm. I hear. I tune into his corner, especially if they're American to speak a language I understand, because I know what I he, what they say. And uh, and to my corner, but my corner there was always my manager. I I had my own, I was my own trainer. I never had a coach. Yeah. So the only thing they say is when somebody hits me, stay calm, relax, because I'm a hot at and I want to pay back. But in thirty minute fight, I get you know. See, so yeah. they say, stay calm, relax, don't do anything but I listen to what they say the whole time. And I know that at the moment the bell goes, I have that feeling. So if nerves show up in the dressing room, you know, which I go, dude, the bell. I go, oh yeah, that's it. I, I, I wish that's, that I had that power with everything else. Like if I go in for auditions so, for movies, yeah. it's the worst, right? I mean, you're the most nervous because everything depends on that one freaking minute that you have to do. And then for me, and I wish that I had that control I had in fighting, in doing additions. It's so funny you say that. I have the same thing. The second they say my name, like so, I have I get I have anxiety about flying. So like on Sunday shows back in the day when I did clubs, on a Sunday show, I would be anxious all day because I knew I had to fly the next day. The second they said my name, ladies and gentlemen, Burt Kreischer, no anxiety whatsoever. I was sick to my stomach. I got food poisoning in Sweden, and we had to fly to Germany. I. I mean, so sick. I didn't drink on the plane to Germany. I was in my bed the majority of the day the, oh, in geez. Germany. Get to the get to the venue. They say my name, and I and I and I immediately. Oh, I, I didn't feel sick at all. I yeah. felt fucking perfect. It's I had a beer night. on stage. It's the best fucking yeah, feeling. I love that feeling. I and wish I way, could access that all the time. But that's that's what I'm saying. Why can't I access that with other things? You know, I want to talk to Jordan Peterson about that. You know, because he's a very smart guy. By the way, anxiety. The auto trainer is going to freaking to help you a lot with For that. real? Yeah, because you have the. I'm going to be very scientific. No, no, no. no hold on, hold on. This is yeah, so. Yeah. So this is a brilliant statement. Not to uh, cut you off. That's all I do. I feel like, but I have noticed sometimes when I'm anxious that I haven't been breathing. Yeah. And all of a sudden, I start going like. <sighs> yes, yeah. You're raising your shoulders completely yeah. wrong. So it needs to go, yeah. this is going to force you to use your breathing muscles. And what you're going to do with that is you're going to stimulate the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is the 10th cranial nerve that evolves, it sends everything to your body, like breathing even, Those are your eye blinking, the, all, the, the things that you don't know that you're doing. It controls all that. And if you stimulate that nerve, your blood pressure goes down, your heart rate goes down, and then in turn, your cortisol levels drop. This is why all these high-level uh, sharpshooters and all these guys all diaphragmatic breathing. So once you start diaphragmatic breathing, this is the wildest thing. Like, I never knew. You see me in my fights, yeah, I'm breathing yeah. like this in a world title fight. You know, that's completely gone. I mean, I'm way much better. But what I used to do in the dressing room, this just blows my mind because now I, I knew... I don't know what I was doing, but it made me very calm. And now I know I, did, I was stimulating the vagus nerve. Now you can stimulate it by breathing, the biggest one, but by also humming and singing and putting what, what uh, cold water in your face and a weird one with Q-tips stimulating the eardrums. But the biggest one is breathing and humming. And what I did, I would, in the dressing room, if I would feel nervous, I would always do, hum. Yeah, that's what they do when they fucking they meditate. Dude, mm. and if you do a low sound, you feel your stomach vibrate. Mm, yeah. And if you have a headache, I would do, mm, and you feel your skull vibrate. And that would take care of my headaches. And this is how I go. And it made me so calm. I remember that I had the doctor coming in. This is like 30 minutes before the fight. And he needed to go by I, my physicals. What are you doing 30 minutes before the fight? And he goes, ooh, Mr. Ice. I go, well, what do you mean? He goes, heart rate 51. I go, oh, I, I didn't even know. But I was, I was doing that stimulating the nerves you know and now i know what i was doing it was the vagus nerve and that you're going to start doing yourself 
out of yourself because this will force you to breathe diaphragmatically. What was the fight that you were most nervous before you took? Like, right, like in the dressing room, what was the, like, because you, you've, I mean, you did you fight the dudes that started Pancras? Yeah. Yeah. Those guys, so we, tell everyone, tell oh. everyone, uh, Pancras is so interesting because I, I, I know nothing about MMA. I know yep. nothing. I really do know, know, know nothing. I only know what I've heard you and Joe talk about, Joe talk about. I just am like a guy who's listened to people say stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I, I don't have the right narrative, but I know and I know a little bit. And Pancras wasn't the one that was tied into the, uh, the Yakuza, was it? Oh, uh, you know, I think that everything is a little bit. That was Pride Fighting Championship. Pride Fighting, Pride Fighting. They became what, was the, what was the uh, the the Asian guy who now lives in Japan? Who Inoki? Inoki, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I know very well. Yeah, yeah. I beat him in a beer drinking contest. No. <laughs> yeah, I told him. I said, "Don't ask me. I'm going to beat you." And now he really wanted to do it. So. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> who can slug down the biggest, the fastest? I go. Um, I want to be in that game. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, but so Pancras was. At, at it started same, before that. It started before that. It before was two dudes right. who were pro wrestlers, right? Yep. yep. And they wanted to fight they, for real. They, yeah, they wanted to just real fight. Yeah. And so it was done in a wrestling ring. It was done almost in wrestling gear. Yep. Rope escapes. Yeah. Was also kind of wrestling. Only the fights were real. And those two and those two dudes were bad motherfuckers, right? I yeah. So the first one, Funaki, he he was the guy. Who, my first loss is him. He did a toe hold, and then people go like, a toe hold. I go, this is not when they grab a toe like hold, the guy said. I saw a guy break his shin bone with a toe hold. Trust me, you know, it's a badass move. And he did that on me. I knew, I didn't know what it was. I knew it hurt, but that was it. He won. And then I went, I fought Suzuki. He was undefeated. I was the first guy to knock him out. That was actually, my wife was there with me because I had two fights in one month. And I said, why don't you come with me? And I train finally, I can train with some other guys there, you know, because I don't have sparring partner. I had one training partner, you know, in Holland. That's it. Really? So that's how I always trained. And he was never able to tap me. So it, it was, I always had to do things that get myself really tired and then let him get on top of me. So that's how I was learning. But I went to Japan with her. And I so you were almost, your training almost consisted of pushing it to 110% all the time. Always. I just always thought the harder the better, which which is is not true, but <laughs> it worked for me. <laughs> do you ever wonder? Do you ever wonder what kind of career you would have had if you had had what you see now with these guys that have these mega camps? Yeah, where they're where they're bringing it. Like like I mean, Connor I think probably has one of the bigger camps where he's got like all the money he can throw at training and all the supplements and all the everything. It's yeah. Uh, I don't know. I don't know, but I I think training partners. They say you're only as good as your training partners. Well, I had one. So imagine me going into a camp and have guys like John Jones and all those guys training with, dude, that's going to make you really good. God, you know, yeah. going you only get better. So, yeah, I wish. But on the other side, I don't wish because they always told me, yeah, now you can make the money. I go, but every champion now is a champion. We started this thing. I started fighting in Japan before the UFC started. Yeah. And I remember because Ken was talking about, he was on the same show, the first Pancras show. And he was talking Ken about Jim this Rock? cage. Yeah. And he said, you know, there's no rules, no referee. And they, man, do you want to do it? I go, nah. And he goes, what do you mean? I go, because they're psychopaths, you know? If, if I get knocked out and a guy hits me or stomps me in the head a few times, I have a family. I, I'm really enjoying my life. That yeah. I don't need. If there's a they're referee. Psychopaths. Right? Yeah. I mean, but anyway, the, for those first three fights were psychopaths. That my buddy, Gerard Godot from Holland, the Cuban yeah. guy who kicked the teeth out of the freaking sumo face. You remember that first, yeah. first fight? Oh my God. Ken Sherrick is talking to me. Dude, this is a funny story. They thought, they were all sitting there and they all still thought that it was going to be a work. That at any moment, the promoter would come in and says, okay, you're going to lose, you're going to win. And that was the thing, right? Yeah. And then they're watching the fights. And then they see Gerard Godot kicking the the big sumo who lives on his knees. And he kicks him in the face. And you see the teeth flying next to the commentators. And everybody, he said, the faces in the dressing room were going like, oh, it's real. <laughs> 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 Oops. Those fights were... Those fights were um... Keith Hackney, you remember the giant killer who had to jump up in order to hit the guy? Halston, find and he this, knocked find him this. out. The, the, I don't. I remember. <clears throat> so we got UFC on a stolen box in college. Yeah. So we could watch the fights on a stolen box. And the, the first fight I remember, I remember Tank being a guy that was like really big. But I remember the first fight we watched was uh, Hoist. And you were like, oh, this guy's going to get 
fucking killed. Yeah, it's pajamas. And yeah, and you're like, what is he fucking? And we we're like, he, this guy didn't know what he's doing. And yeah. then being like, holy shit, how much jujitsu did you know going into Pancras? Zero. But so you, but you, but you did. It does seem like you knew. Enough to take someone's back and to like do no, the... the first fights. If I'm holding somebody who is in my guard with my hands like this, it's yeah. like this is the worst grip. You know, you hold like this, you're the this, gable you know, grip, it's like right? a gable yeah. grip. Yeah. yeah, this is the gable, and then the... so I, I, uh, yeah, not a lot. I didn't know a lot, but I was always good with seeing things, improvising almost. Impro well, you know, I see some when I see some, I, I could do my black belt tests almost by watching a kata on paper, and then I could do the kata. Listen, this is how I get my fifth degree. Everybody says fifth degree Kikushin. I say, yeah, but I never did a test for my fifth degree Kikushin belt, which is full contact karate. <clears throat> I got it as an honorary. And the reason was because I was in Japan. It was the day before the fight. And John Blooming, which is the highest gaijin, the, the foreigner uh, next uh, to Masoyama. Masoyama is the guy who used to knock out bulls. Yeah. And he started Kikushin karate. That guy is a freaking crazy, crazy guy. He's got a 12th degree. And John Blooming, I'm doing this because he was standing behind me, is, is 11 degree. And we were watching, we walking on the streets in Japan with a bunch of fighters that we hear, hybrid wrestling, pancreas, and we go, oh, and we looked at the, I mean, this is 94, 95, yeah. and it was a giant screen. Like, I've never seen anything like, and the first thing we see is me knocking somebody out with the palm strike, my very first yeah. fight. We go, whoa, that's the preview for tomorrow. So we're watching, and I see a guy sitting in half guard, and he goes for an inverted heel look. It's a long explanation, but that's why you, they flip the, the foot like that to the other way around. And I look at John and I go, like, that's a cool move. I should remember that. And the next day I'm fighting, I'm in that position. I go, oh, might as well try it. Right? <laughs> now I never did it before. So I had no clue the amount of pressure was. I broke his freaking shin bone in half. So, and then he came to me. <laughs> yeah, he goes. <laughs> he just casually go, I didn't know much pressure. Was. I broke his shin bone in half. Yeah. Fuck. It that's was the wildest thing. Changer. Look at this. Pop, this is my first fight. Yeah. Does the body shot? I think, yeah. God. That's behind the ear. People never got it. I go, I, dude, I don't hit the, the jaw. I hit behind the ear with the bone on my wrist. Dude, it's so powerful. Bonk. She had behind the ear. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> right mean, behind the ear. And this was a move I came up with. Dude, you know what that is? What? I stop him from expanding his chest. And what did is that, I just is say? that when you put him, it looks like a small package, yeah. like you grab his, his legs on his head. Now I know why he taps, because he couldn't breathe, like, because yeah. he couldn't expand his chest. You see, all these things I did unknowingly, and that have to do with breathing. I, I had no freaking clue. It's amazing how, how, how insightful you knew how to fight without the massive amount of training you see people getting these days. You just kind of were improvising in the ring and yeah. doing what you thought worked, and it did. I mean, you like when you see some of these fights, you're putting people in, like you're putting people in like, Toe holds and and leg locks yep. and and arm bars, but without any like formal training of how to do it. I was just, you know, once I, the, how do I say it? It clicked. It was the most dumbest thing on the planet. I couldn't get it, couldn't get it, couldn't get it. And then the guy reversed me. And that was the first guy who said, hey, boss, you know what you're doing wrong. I said, what? He says, well... If you're on top of somebody and he can trap your arm from posting out and he trap this leg from posting out, he can push you to that side because she can base out. And I'm looking at him, I go, ah, this is the, wh why did I see that? And, and that somehow applied on everything. I never, ta I, I think I tapped twice in my life in training. Yeah. And that was when I was really freaking drunk, almost about to throw up, and otherwise I wouldn't have tapped. Yeah. You see, so at one time, with a, with a, when I never saw like a calf split they have on their leg, and they did it on my arm, and it was a week before the fight, I didn't want to fight it. But you see, but that thing, which was a stupid thing to say, but very a smart thing to say to me, that apparently applied even to my submissions. Now I start reversing everybody, and my, now my submission, I go, how is this even possible? It was like the one missing ingredient, and somehow that made sense to everything else. It That's was really weird. so crazy. Wildest thing ever. I couldn't even believe it. I go, what's going on? I mean, I just roll up with everybody, no more problems. Yeah, I feel like, I feel like, uh, I feel like you, you're, you're forced to do that in stand up because you're forced to figure it out in stand up. Yeah, yeah. Like I remember, you know, there are people that I think watch stand up and then and then analyze it and then write down and then they're they're always derivative, but in order to find your own voice, it's it's it is it is learning about a, a, how a submission or or a part of the 
the mechanics of the move works. The mo yeah, especially with stand up. You know, I I know Kevin very well. Right, yeah. we're very close. But if you see how they you drop something in the beginning and it comes back at the back, you know, and like it's it's a freaking art. It's very hard what you guys do. And then you have also the the audience. You have the interaction, and if it doesn't work, well, you're gonna have to make it work. You know, mm -hmm. there's no like, uh, okay, I'm gonna stop. You see, and then or maybe go to a break, and then they say, okay, you got to treat it a different way. You got to come in from a different way. Is there a backup plan? Well, you guys have all these backup plans, but yeah. we don't know. We just think you go up and tell a funny story. But there's so much behind stand-up oh, comedy, and there's so much pressure. Like for me, I always wanted to do it just like 10 or five minutes. Do you, you stand know? up? Yeah, just for fun one yeah. time, tell the story. I said, but the whole show- Bo Boss, you're so good at telling stories. Yeah, but you know, it's also, I know the pressure that you guys get. I mean, in front of an audience, like if there's an audience, I do public speaking as well. And if the, if I can't see the audience, like the lights on you, it's it's much easier than when you look at all the reactions of the people because you start reading the people, which you shouldn't do, of course, because there's always yeah. people that want on the phone. And goes, you know, so, but with you guys, you do it in a, in a club where, you're doing stand up and the person sits right there. Yeah. So there's no way of, and then if you bomb, you bomb and you all bombed, right? Everybody yeah. says, oh, yeah, yeah, everybody yeah. bombs, but to get out of that. So high, highly respect. That's why you guys are also so good at acting. You see all the stand up comedians tell mm -hmm. me why that sucks in acting, right? Uh, I'm, I'm pretty amazed with it. Well, you're, you, you hang out with a, you hang out with the who's who of stand up comedians. So not every stand up comedian. I mean, you're best friends with Kevin and Joe, and like the, <laughs> those guys are the fucking shit, you know? Who you, who you were watching? Who, who, how did you get started with that? It's like Eddie Murphy or something? Or? Uh, no, I. Uh, so I, I didn't watch much stand up in college. <laughs> I had seen Sam Kinison and Eddie Murphy. Oh, yeah. Those were my two guys that, like, Eddie Murphy, I didn't really get it uh, when I was a kid because I was too young. But my, I remember watching my parents and my uncles watch uh, either Raw or Delirious or yeah, both. Yeah. I remember watching hey, them boy. watch it. And their <laughs> fucking response was so yeah, yeah. through the roof. And then in fifth grade, I think fifth grade, maybe eighth grade, um, Brian Callahan played uh, Sam Kinison uh, to me in the back of the bus going ice skating. We were going ice skating with our class. And we were crying laughing. And then ninth grade, Dice came out. Oh, and, and the fighters brought Andrew Dice for me the videotapes. Oh, yeah. And we were, and at that, and and those were my representations of stand up. And I, and 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 then I, and then in college, I just was funny. Like I just was like everyone's like you're the funniest guy I've ever met. You should do stand up. And I was like I, I don't know how that would work. And then I got written up in Rolling Stone magazine as the number one party animal in the country. And I was like I should try it. Tried it one time, and I think. Well, I think probably was your promo like right there. you, I was like, I was really good immediately. Yeah. Like immediately I was, I was better than anyone on the show. Wow. And I was like, wow. And then I moved to New York and I think what I did, if I mean, if we're using analogies in this is I started trust, trusting my instincts less and watch and, and being more derivative of what everyone else did mm -hmm. because I knew that it worked and it was <clears throat> safe. And it was recognizable. Yeah. And I wanted the approval of my peers more than I wanted, more than I cared Just about the art really of it. Say what fight us, yep. Yeah, and then when I met Joe, um, I was really good stand-up. And I, I had hints of why I was a good stand-up. But m so much of my show, my, my 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 act was clouded in um, in just bullshit that the stuff didn't come through. And then I told the machine story on Joe's podcast. And he told he's told me you, know, you need to tell it on stage. And in working on that story, it changed my stand up forever. It changed who I was. I didn't give a shit about approval. I didn't give a shit about anyone's uh, approval. I wanted if I found it funny or if Leanne found it funny, I I then led with that. Yeah. And now I, I now I could not explain to you, I could not <clears throat> explain to you why I have a career. I do not know why people find me funny. I do not know. All I know is I can do one thing. I can tell you what I think's funny, and then for whatever reason, like I did. I have college kids that are fans of mine. Yeah. I mean, all I do is talk about my fucking family. My my yeah. my my daughter is the biggest. That's how I got to know you. You yeah. know, you, you just met her. I said, but listen, this is so funny that you say that because this is literally what I said yesterday again to a student of mine. If you master, this is what I mastered, to don't give a crap what other people think about you. 
you'll fight at your best. Yeah. Because there's zero pressure. But as soon as you're going to say like, uh, oh, I better, uh, and you tell the whole world that you're going to fight, they're all in the audience now, and, you, yeah. and, and tell the big stories, like I'm going to rip him off and he's nasty. Oh, yeah. And then, you know, you put more and more pressure on yourself. I said, don't do that. You just relax and don't care what people might say. And once you fight for yourself, like people would ask me, who do you fight for? For your family? I go, no, I fight for me. And they look at me weird. They say, listen, if I fight for my family, I put way too much pressure on me. Now I need to win in order. I said, but if I don't give a oh, crap. Boss. That I, the best. I could not, I could not, when I was doing stand up for money, yeah. meaning like I, I want to get this development deal, yep. the amount of pressure on me was overwhelming. When I was doing stuff for my girls, it, the, oh, the pressure was overwhelming. When I, even television, when I got the game changer for me was when this podcast got funded and I started getting sponsors, started making money, I realized, oh, stand up, it really kind of set me free. Yep. I was like, I'll do whatever the fuck I want on stage. Yep. This is making money. That's also making money. I can be as pure as I want there as to what I want to do. I Like I said, I don't know. I do not know why. I don't know how I have fans that are in high school, fans that are in college, fans that are, are, are in their 20s, in their 30s, uh, frat boys, uh, conservatives, liberals. I have no clue yep. why, and why, why that, how I got... You're how real. I got this lucky. You're real. That's what it is. And everybody can tell. You know, you see your other videos, you know, with the family and how you are. You're real. You're just, what, what, is, I, what they find is you. I try to be as real as possible. I don't know. I, you know, I think I think about the same thing. I was thinking about this with you because you, you've been so many different versions of the same guy. Like, you, but you've, you know, you got your, your street fighting videos, Oh, you know. The 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 breathing te- the O2 trainer like you you are pretty entrepreneurial you've been an actor you've trained with comedians you've been in movies you've done so much shit yeah like I go wonder what I would do if I had if I had one time thrown a punch that landed I wonder if that I wonder if that like I, or, 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 I used to think of like uh, diving I like I, I go I never tried to dive skydive or diving uh, diving on sub- a, in a pool in a pool yeah I never tried that oh it's the best. I, yeah. Like I never tried it. And I go. I wonder if I missed my window. Like if I just, if I like the, the how oh, like I, like yeah, like maybe I would have been brilliant. <laughs> okay, Razzle, like, yeah. watch out now. You're pushing it, buddy. <laughs> I, but it's like funny. The things that find you are like the things that you're drawn to, and you have no you have no control over. I was a chef. I went four years to culinary school. Are you serious? Yeah, and then I, I became a fighter. How the heck is that happening? Wait, we went. Do you cook now still? Yeah, yeah, I still cook. Yeah, it's a, my wife's a really good cook as well, so we're very blessed. I gotta have you. I gotta have you on my my cooking show. <laughs> oh, you have a cooking show. I have a cooking show, show called Something's Burning, <laughs> okay. where I make meals for people. And okay. I, yeah, I'll make. I love to have you on my cooking. Oh, show. Oh, let's let's do it. I'll I'll do you the, the root and breakfast. This is the most basic breakfast there is. I do it with the red wine sauce, and it's it's with steak. Yeah. And then you have bread. I make fresh bread, good. And you you dip it in the wine sauce. But the wine sauce, I make it hot in the pan. And it's, it's, it boils the alcohol out, but it's with garlic and some herbs that I put in. Do it. Everybody who's tasting, they dip the bread in there. They go like, dude. And that's just serious? that's what every Sunday we do with the family. Pretty much every Sunday we just had it again. Really? Where do you live? Do you live out here? Oh, we live in Texas now. Oh, really? Yeah, I was just here for. Uh, I get it still owned the gym. Uh, the auto trainer to actually make a Newberry Park. It's American made now. I had to pull it out of China. And then we have our uh, youngest daughter, our oldest daughter is here. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, this is always a good way for to combine everything. What um what was <clears throat> do you how what was the, did you have sons? No, I have a grandson though, a seven oh, yeah. year old, yeah. Really? My oldest daughter lives in Belgium and she's thirty three. Yeah, this is from a, a previous wife that I had. Yeah. And uh yeah, I was just was there. I was I mean two weeks ago I was there. Really? Yeah, I just came back. What what uh how did you, what was the advice you gave to your kids about fighting or, <clears throat> or about the self defense? Especially well, the, daughters. Yeah, well they knew the submissions. They because that's I'm teaching them. <laughs> How you great know, is joking. That? How great is that? <laughs> they knew the submissions. And punching, like the one here downstairs, Bianca, she's she's too light. Uh she's a hundred pounds, but she she could be right really now. She's like, Dad, yeah, she's got freaking <laughs> At four, she had apps. It was like the what people go like, "What?" I go, "She's not doing anything." I have no clue. She's just a freak, genetic freak. You, well, you you're a freak, genetic freak. <laughs> yeah, I've been yeah. always blessed because still now till this day, they go like, "What do you weigh?" I go, "It's the same when I started fighting." And I don't use anything. There's no TRT, no nothing. You know, really. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's still all. It's all just. Do you natural. watch your diet at all? 
I do now. After my last fight in 2006, because I fought after seven years of not competing, I realized that actually food was a big thing because before I just ate pizza and I go to fight, who yeah. cares? But then it was, since I was 42 years old, I thought maybe I said, I got a dietitian and uh, and he helped me. And I started looking much better. I go out and start feeling better. I go, oh, I should have done this before, but you know. So, and that's from that moment on, I just kept eating like that. Yeah. I still got my freaking in and out burgers and I do all that, you know, because it's just really good. But I try <sighs> breakfast to make it at least healthy. I'm, I just woke up this morning. I've, people have heard me say this a million times. I ate so out of control yesterday yeah. <laughs> and I tried not to and I just did. And that I went, I passed out at a friend's house on their couch at dinner. I went over to their couch and passed out and woke up and was laying in bed feeling like I had, I was, I was like, I actually put on weight today. Yeah. Like I felt, I feel like I put on weight <laughs> and and I've all I've been doing is shitting this morning. Yeah. I'm taking like four legit shits. But, but what, what do you eat then? Is it because uh, it's. Uh, Everything yesterday. Oh, everything. Uh, yesterday okay. was everything. Okay. Yesterday. Doesn't matter. Yesterday was everyone. Yeah, I, I'm trying to do this intermittent Four fasting. Four legit shits. Oh, I mean, just everything. <laughs> I had I had four legit shits today. I had seafood pasta. I had a bowl of French onion soup. I had, with I had the cheese? avocado. Yeah, yeah double voice. with the cheese. Because like, they had the cheese there so I could put it on. I had like a bottle of wine, four drinks on the plane, two beers when we landed, oh. a beer when we got home, Cheetos. Uh, Cheetos, Doritos, and Fritos. Oh, I was like fucking on a tear. How, how old are you? 50. 50? <laughs> yeah, I look really young. That's amazing, I yeah. I really young. That just tells you, because you know what you do? Oh, I know. I, I, my, Tom Segura looks like he's 57, I, and he's 49 or something. Yeah. <laughs> I'm turning 58 in two days. Really? 58, yeah. You look crazy. great. Yeah. Well, I'm getting older there, but uh, you know what I realized is that, you know, I had to slow down, you know, because I was going... Really? I was insane. I mean, I drink 12 beers, two bottles of tequila, easy. And then the next day I work out and I run out. But I was insane. I got the same, I got the same thing. Where yeah. I go, can I tell you what? I, I just don't have anger Can I tell you what's fucking me up? <laughs> so I, I was, we've been on the road pretty aggressively and I was partying balls. And uh, and then we got to Tampa and uh, they were like, hey, do you want to come by? I grew up in Tampa. They go, you want to come by your old high school? The baseball team's out there. You want to take batting practice with them? And I was like, I was oh, like, I yeah. saw that. I was like, I yeah. It. I was like, I don't know if I'll go. I don't know if I'll take batting practice, but I'll go out there. And I went out there at 50 years old, and I hit a home run. Yeah, I saw you. Anyway. And I was fucking blown away that, and all of a sudden, I got really cocky. Where I was like, <laughs> I was like, I was like, I'm hitting fucking dingers at 50. I'm hitting fucking home runs at 50. Are you fucking kidding me? Is it up? These are all kids in the in their peak years of testosterone, right? <laughs> and then oh, here yeah. comes this drunk as shit the night before. <laughs> By the way, I, I, this was like twenty five pitches. I was not leaving until I hit a home run. And then, oh, but you're hitting boom. the balls. Look at there. <laughs> the greatest fucking feeling. The greatest fucking feeling. Uh, yeah, but I like to party. I, I have I have never had a problem partying and getting up and getting my shit. Me neither. Done. Yeah. Never. I will be completely done. They have to carry me in my room and then the next day I do a show. Yeah, I get yo, oh, yeah. I get and up. I go, like, how's that even possible? I go, oh, or I'm at eight AM, I'm at the, the production meeting. And you go, how do you get out of bed? I go, well, well it's work, right? We gotta do it. Otherwise I wouldn't do it if yeah. I can't handle it. Yeah, tell know? me, tell me tell, <sighs> I, what I do is I'll schedule uh workouts for early. So I go seven thirty workout, I'll have my trainer meet me I have a gym at my house. I'll have my trainer there, and then I I just know it has to happen. Yeah, that's uh, and I'm very punitive. I get very I I punish myself with ideas. Oh, I do I go, the same thing. I go, you wanted you wanted to party last night. This is what you get. Yeah, yeah. And also, if I don't do it, I can't look at myself in the mirror. If I brush my teeth, I go, it's a failure, man. I did. Yeah. I said I was going to do something, and I didn't do it. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I did that this morning. I, I got up. I had a meeting at nine, and then I ha we were doing this at eleven, right? And mm -hmm. and then I said. So I have an hour and a half. I'm going to get on the treadmill. I'm going to run. And uh, and then I'm going to set up a training. I'm going to train with my trainer later. But I go, I need to get on the treadmill. I got to get on the treadmill. And I, if things are getting away from me, get away from me. I go, F fucking stop everything. Just yep. get on the treadmill and go. Because like that will that has always helped my serotonin. Every, it helps also, like, if I have to memorize things for movie scripts or something. Yeah. If I work out, I do it in half the time than when I don't work out. Can I tell you, because I feel like we have similar brains, can I tell you what helps me with memorizing scripts? is uh i'm really bad at memorizing really bad mm -hmm. but if you put if you show me 
places to stand. If you do the blocking with yeah, me, yeah, yeah. I'm so much better. Like once you go, so you add movement. Yeah, you walk then, in the room, and then I, and and so I, when we did the, we just did a movie in Serbia, and I am I would I would read the script at night, and I, I helped write the script, and yeah. I would read it. And I was like, I'm never gonna fucking remember this. <laughs> And then I get this script. A little, little late start to it, right? If yeah. It's the day before. Day be- and I'm like, I'm like, I read the script 180 <clears throat> times. And then I was like, I'm never going to remember. And then that first day, just the blocking of it, I was like, oh, I can, yeah, oh, yeah. I can do that. Yeah. And then that, and then, I, and then I stopped even looking at the scripts the night before because they changed the next morning. And I'd be like, ah, oh, whatever. And I would, I, they would do, I could, I, I'm also dyslexic and I didn't have reading glasses. So I would have a Serbian woman, Anya, read for me. So in the, in the rehearsal, it would be Mark Hamill, me, and the, the director, and then Anya. She would read my lines. I would hear them. And then I'd go, okay, that's what I, I know what I'm doing. And then I would do the next rehearsal. They'd block it, and I'd be done. I'd have it, I'd have it memorized immediately. Dude, this is so weird because you know how to, if you need the grocery list, if you need to memorize that, you know what they do? What? That's the best way to do it. Stanley, you need coffee. You put coffee, a, a bag of coffee, on your kitchen table. Yeah. In your mind. And then you put next to the X and you put next to it. And as soon as you visualize that, and so you're kind of doing the reverse of that. Yeah. You see, you, you're doing it with movement in where you have to stand. You see, you're attaching something to what you have to say. I can't just memorize. memorize something in a vacuum of it's like ideas. I'm, but I'm, once it's in there with me, I do not lose it anymore. Oh, that's so funny you say right? that. So mm-hmm. I do that with my routing when I do, so I do promos for all the shows. And so like, like, when, like this weekend I'm in, and I just do it on a map. I'll go, uh, Cedar Rapids, Green Bay, Minneapolis, Grand Forks, Fargo. But I just, I do it in my head, even if it's wrong. Even if it's wrong, yeah. I go, because technically Green Bay is here. Yeah, because in your mind is right. But I go, Green Bay, yeah, but in my mind it's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this podcast is brought to you by Electric E-Bike. There's no better way to get outside and enjoy the spring this season than with an electric e-bike. Transform your trips across town or to the beach into a carefree and fun adventure with electric e-bike discover your local area or experience the freedom of the great outdoors with a fun fast and foldable electric e-bike during their ready set spring sale i have a electric e-bike it's it's electric electric e-bike and i fucking love it it is foldable i can throw it in the back of the truck take it out to the beach bring it home ride it down at the beach have a blast throw it back in take it out here it's what i ride to work every day it, there's so much fun. If you've never had one, just for like a quick trip to the store, literally I take them for outdoors adventures. Electric e-bikes will transform how you get around with quality, feature-filled models, finance as low as $73 per month. Your adventures won't cost a fortune. They include a powerful removable battery, a bright LCD screen, seven speeds gearing, five levels of pedal assist to power your ride, plus you can lower your gas costs and reduce your carbon footprint. Let me tell you something. If you're not paying attention to your carbon footprint, your kids will have to. Start your next adventure with Electric E-Bike Ready, Set, Spring Sale. Visit electricebikes.com to learn more and explore their new Expedition Cargo e-bikes and all the other epic models Electric has to offer. That's L-E-C-T-R-I-C ebikes.com. You ever yeah. thought about writing a self-help book? Uh, you know, I've been thinking. I do a lot of talking now also. and I, the when, way you, when you do talking, what is it? Is it pr- primarily like uh, like inspirational? Yeah, it's it's more, uh, you know, what, what we believe is a man and what and, and, and what a real man is. Like, you know, we, we all believe like uh, drinking and partying and also, we, well, you're out of control. You got no control. You yeah. know, it's like, it's fun. It's great. And I did a lot, lot you know, but to be the guy to be perfect in control, to, to have the balls, to have the power to say no to a third drink. Yeah, that's that's, that's fucking, now we're talking. You see, so so, yeah. and then I'm trying to, because right now with all the social media and everything, it's so bad for the kids and the short term uh, attention span and everything is about that. You know, you put two guys flipping off the cameras, it's like boom, hundred thousand likes. And you try to do a, a fundraiser for a charity event, and you got like three hundred people, three hundred likes. This is how the world is right now. Yeah, you know, and I try to hopefully that get inside young men's heads. And say, hey, listen, it's not about that. It's not about attacking every girl and doing this. You know, that's not being a man. The guy who is in control, that's the man. You know, and later on, you're going to be more happy with yourself. Because I realized that I was that guy. I did all that, you know. And now I go like, whoa, if I could t- turn back the clock, I would have stopped sooner doing every day getting drunk. You know, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. It doesn't, you do it once a week. Why don't you do that? You see what I mean? So 
too much is always too much. But I also I, like I I I I was a I'm in love with, and I have a hard time disconnecting with the the joy of impulse. Yeah, when impulse shows up, and I, I think I, I I mean that's why I bet fighting must be exhilarating because the impulse of this is happening. It started. Oh yeah, it's going. You can't stop it. You can't Just stop it. This train's now. left the station, <clears throat> yeah. and you, we're going ninety miles an hour. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. It's uh, it's crazy how that works. But it's funny. It's also. And by the way, um, the machine story, right? Yes. Because I I had to show it because I have a picture of this and I I don't I, I can't show it here because I went to the Ukraine. I have a similar story. I love this. Do it. <clears throat> so, well, it's, it's it made me think of this story. Please. So I'm invited. This is 1996. I'm invited to the Ukraine to do a commentating thing. Igor of Chanch in his face fighting there, in the freaking freaking Ukraine. And uh, he's fighting these monsters. No weight class. I mean, he's the lightest guy. He's 190 pounds. Pull up the picture of him, Igor who? Vov Chanchin. V O V Chanchin. The, the, the lightest guy he fought was like 300 pounds. And he's like, you know, uh, you, know, you know who's in my movie is Oleg. Uh, Taktarov. Yeah. Oh, he's awesome. Yeah, Freaking, he's awesome. He's a freak too. He's awesome. Great guy. There we go. That's the guy. Okay. Dude, he would just freak, annihilate people. Fought for Pride Fighting Championship a long, long time too. Anyway, we're having a cage fight there. And I'm still living in Holland. And um, I um, I get an invitation from them, faxed, and I go to to the Ukraine. And while I'm there, I'm going up the airport, and they're all standing with freaking machine guns, and they're eyeballing me. And I decided not to look back, you know, because this is gonna go wrong. I'm looking down, and the guy comes. Of I I'm, I, I give my passport, and the guy goes invitation. <clears throat> so excuse me. He goes invitation. I go oh, oh relax, do it. Then he goes pop. He puts it on the the. The desk, and I go, oh yeah, they sent it to me. He says, but nobody told me to bring it. He goes, whoop! I get caught, hand, handcuffs on, throw in the room. I go, okay, what's? Well, and I'm standing in the room by myself. And thirty seconds later, very fast, some guy comes in, takes me with him, making pictures of me, yeah. making pictures. Then they uncuff me, fingerprints. I'm doing the fingerprints, and then they said thirty-five dollars. And he goes, thirty-five dollars for what? He says, for the pictures. I go, I didn't ask for pictures, dude. I'm not going to get it. But he's kept on pushing, and I go, this is going to go wrong. So I go, I only have guilders. This was before the Euro. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I got Dutch guilders. He goes, you you change. I go, you you change. And I'm now I'm getting angry. Yeah. I go, this is full of crap. What are you guys are doing? And then I hear this guy yelling, and there's a little guy walking in with a limp on a cane. And he looked like Joe Pesci. I'm going to show you a picture because I have a picture with him. Like I said, I'm not going to show it on, on camera because <laughs> he's, a, he's, a, he's a mafia, mafioso. And uh, he's with two giant um, uh, security guys. And, um, and he goes to these guards and he gives everybody a hundred bucks. hundred bucks, hundred bucks, hundred bucks. He yells at one guy. He runs away. He comes back with my luggage. We just walk out. And while we walk out to the, the airport, all these people on my plane are the luggage is open. They're checking. We just walk out. I could have had freaking whatever in those bags. Yeah. I could just walk out. Come outside. It's like a winter time. It's, it's snowing, black snow. It's like the pollution or something really weird. And it's all these old Lada cars. And there's oh, one, the of course. Oh, these oh, Lada yeah, plastic yeah. cars, right? And one Cadillac. Of course, that's him. So I'm getting in the drivers in, all, in there already. He's riding shotgun, the, the mafioso. And uh, I'm going to pull up a picture because you gotta, you, you're going to see this. Because, okay, this is the guy. The guy next to you, you tell me if he doesn't look like Joe Pesci. It's like that. And then, oh my God. Oh my God, right? Yeah. And then the guy next to me, there's a cop. I'm wearing the cop's hat. He was drunk as crap. That's He's you? Drunk. Yeah, that's <laughs> me with, it, with the cop's hat on. I was in the police car. Dude, it was hilarious. So this, so this guy with the glasses, that's what everyone I knew looked like. Yeah. That's knew, what everyone I knew looked like. Everybody was very afraid of this guy. Yeah. So we're we're in the and now I'm in the in the in the drive and we go I don't know where we're going. I didn't know it was a two hour drive and nobody says a word. And I'm sitting in my and my wife has been telling me a long time, she so one of these days they're gonna kill you. I mean, you're crazy, you're doing way too much crazy stuff, and these people, you know, some people cannot handle that. And I'm sitting there, oh shit, you know. Now, this is the drive. This is the drive. And this is also before the Ukraine pulled away, like in the 91 or something, like they, they separated from Russia. Yeah. So they didn't have the real money anymore. So we're this is Mad Max time. This is this is miles. Like I'm thinking of freaking hundred miles. It, it was a very long time with desert. It was snow, but like sand. And then with these big giant buildings on them that they didn't finish. So you see like the skeletons of the buildings and people yeah. living in there and the people walking around with grocery bags. It was a really weird situation. And finally, after two years, we arrived, of two hours, we arrive and we go to a restaurant 
And uh, and still nobody says a word. And I'm like, okay, at least we're in a restaurant. We got witnesses now, you know. So this is yeah. it's good. It's, it's not like plastic on the floor, <laughs> you know. Check that, you know, for the blood. So I'm sitting there, and they come bring the bread, and they bring some butter, and there's no garlic butter. So I go, I make myself. So I grab the butter and I put it on my bread, and add a little bit of salt, add a little bit of pepper. It's just before I want to eat it, the Joe Pesci guy goes like, "Mrs." And I go, what? It goes this. I said, it was good. And he goes, he's, he's looking at me. I said, do it here. Take it, take it. Try, try it. And he bites. And he goes, whoa, <laughs> And then suddenly everybody, <laughs> vodka came and the whole thing started. Dude, this guy had a combination of like a casino, a strip club, a nightclub, everything. So, and I'm getting drunk with these guys. Yeah. And I'm freaking sh shooting big glasses of vodka, which that was too much for me. And I'm on, on the dance. I'm pole dancing. <laughs> Uh, security guards come. <laughs> One guy wants to come with. Uh, I need to come with him, and he showed his MP5. Yeah. So I just grabbed the pill and slapped him in the face. You know this whole thing. And then they finally come with another guy. They take me away. Joe Pesci showed up again. No, nope. he's with us. He goes, oh, so sorry, sorry. Paul Verlands. Do you remember that guy, the no. polar bear no, who no, fought no. in the UFC, the big giant three hundred twenty pound guy? Awesome, Paul Verlands. Unfortunately, he passed away. Really good guy, funny guy. Yeah. It was before the fight. He's drinking as well. He's fighting. He's fighting in Ukraine. In Ukraine, he's fighting. He's one of the guys with the three big guys that I said. Yeah, he he passed away, but he, it's very nice. He told this story actually on the podcast. Also, I heard because he's getting so drunk and he grabs me from behind suddenly and he starts biting in my back. And this is in the casino there, right? Yeah, what's this guy? A giant. Oh my god. Yeah, yeah Mark, I remember. Look him. at Marco who was there. That picture, one down and then to the right, that one. Look at this, Marco Huas. Marco Huas, my training partner. He's oh like a 230 pounds. Look at the difference. He is massive. He's massive. But Marco kicked his legs and then he dropped with leg kicks. So this big guy, he's attacking me from the back and he's biting. He, he bit through my skin. You know, later on we saw there was a hole. I said, Paul, you're hurting me. You got to stop, dude. I'm going to freaking throw you. <laughs> and in front of me, there is like a, a, a mirror against the wall, which I thought was a mirror. So I go, screw it. So I figure for his arm like, and I make a sidestep and I throw him against the wall. Well, it was one of those see-through mirrors on one side, you know, security was sitting behind it. So he goes through the freaking glass, stitches everywhere, had to go to the hospital, do the wildest freaking trip. We went to a war museum. Dude, they had lamp lamps made out of human skin. Oh, gloves, then guillotines. And then, hey, 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 no discrimination. <laughs> guillotines for little kids. Like little guillotines. I go, did I need to get that? I go, oh, yeah, very scary. I go, I don't want to be here. <laughs> this is too crazy. Wildest trip ever. And especially that police officer, the, yeah. he was drinking vodka. He was just drunk as, as crap and with his cap. Oh, here, get my hat. Wildest thing ever. Those were the Russians. God, you, I bet you have millions of those stories. I have a lot of stories like that. I because have stories Japan. that- Japan. Ukraine, where 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 all countries did you fight in? Oh, uh, that's it. Um, I fought in, in in Holland, need to say, and then Japan and the U.S. And then and and then what was the transformation? I'll get you out of here soon. I don't want to. No, no, I, I could talk to you uh, yeah, forever. Yeah, yeah. I could talk to you forever. Um, what was it like? What was it like leaving? Finally going over to UFC. It was it was a lot for me because I I really wanted to go to the UFC. I I you know the main reason this might sounds really weird, the theme. <laughs> you remember at the time it was just that music. It was like a video game. Yeah. I got to get up with that song. That's a badass song. And I'm boss with the whole this country. I go, oh, that's so badass. That's what I really loved. I really wanted to come up with the song. So really weird. I actually wanted to add the three to Norse to it. The, I like to be in America. There's this 30 second clip. I said, yeah. let me put that before that song. And then they come out, they didn't want to do it. I go, dude, that's the best. I mean, can't the audience, they're going to love this stuff. But they didn't want to do it. How, how hard was the transition from pancreas to... Uh, nothing. Nothing? No, it's it was easier. Was, now yeah, I can close it, my first. So I mean, finally, I feel like I can't kick, you know, because I was kickboxing already. Yeah. So yeah, now it made it easier for me, I think. And, and, and also in pancreas, the open hand strike, I used to fight like that as a bouncer. Because I saw my guys, if you fight multiple guys, it's not like you start aiming for the jaw, you know, you try to knock out everybody. So you hit the skull, well, you break your hand. Yeah. You know? So all these everybody is breaking their hands. I go, yeah, I'm going to. So I start hitting the bag already with palms. Oh, really? And then with the bone. I hit with the bone behind the ear. So they always, oh, he slapped him. I go, oh, no, watch the fights. I hit, yeah. Like the fight I just saw when I said that was behind the ear, it's just with this part of the bone. 
and just this, if you do this to yourself, just this, try that. You yeah. feel the shaking the, yeah. because you're not ready for impact. You're ready for impact here and here and here, but never this this side. And you'll break your hand if you hit someone. Also that, yeah. if you, you can, especially if you do it over and you hit with the tiny bones, yeah, they're gonna snap, of course, if you hit wrong. And everything can go wrong in a fight, of course. Was was <laughs> was UFC, did you find, was UFC better than Pancras? Because I mean, I think people look at, a, at the, and go, well, obviously UFC is the number one thing. Was it that, did you, find it to be that much better than Pancras, or was it? No, I did. At, at the time, it was just, uh, uh, I think the submission guys from Pancras, they were way better. Who's that? Is that? That's Sunoco? the guy who first beat me, and that was the second time I I really wanted to annihilate him. He came to me before the fight, like in my face, and he slid his throat with his thumb, and I go, okay. Oh, that's, I'm gonna what kill was his name? Funu Funaki. Funaki. That was one of the owners. Yeah, that was one of the owners, yeah. Yeah. And that, that fight, I really took it to him. I look at my, my manager said, you got to stay calm. I said, don't worry, I'll stay fight. calm. That's, That's the, the fight. fight. I said, well, once is I it connect. Weird, is it weird watching yourself fight? Yeah, I, yeah, because I know the ways that, the, what I was thinking at the time, I was, I was just such an angry. <laughs> that was the first fight. You see, he, lost, he got me at that. That's a hold. That was a toe hold. So now the rematch goes, and now I'm a different animal. Now I just already won like 10 fights by submission. When, when I learned the submission game, after my last loss by submission, I started doing submissions two, three times a day, and I won my next eight fights by submission. Now it was like, I, I never lost a fight anymore after yeah. that. I, won, I, I didn't lose in my last 22. But it was just because I made that decision to start learning the ground game. It's kind of interesting thinking that Lion's Den had all these trainers that were coming out of that one, all these fighters that were coming out of that one camp, yep. and you were just you. I was just me. You know, it was it was weird, you know, and I, I always thought they were everybody was there and I was here and then I rolled with all the guys. Yeah. And that's when I came you over. Were, friends I with, were you friends with Frank? Yeah, with Frank, yeah, yeah. still. And you know, all, all these guys, they're great guys. You and Frank fought three times. Three times. Yeah. I mean, it's just so crazy to watch and think that is you. It is. I mean, it, so many people how many people are at these uh, venues? At the time, do you know? This uh, 12, 15,000. This one's probably the NK, NK Hall, I think. I fought in the Budokan. That was a cool one. Look at it. Look at my leg, how it's bent. I have no clue how I don't not, don't tap. Yeah. He reversed my leg like 180. I go, but I didn't feel it somehow. So I go, okay, we'll keep on going. I'm amazed. Is it when you get a person like, uh, when you get a person where you're just hammering them with liver kicks and they're going down and you're watching them going down and you know if I go back there it's going to hurt I I, I that that's their soft spot now. Yeah. Is oh, yeah, it is, there, is it hard to do that repeatedly or is there a part of you going like, dude, just give up? Well, you know, the trick is also to what a lot of people do, do once you hurt somebody there, what do you think his defense is going to be? Oh, yeah. So you see, and this corner till this day, this corner you will go like, go for the body, go for it. no, and you will hear me say to my students, go for the head. Because, you know, you need to bring the hands back up. Go for the head. Once the hands go back up, go back to the body. You see, it's a very basic, simple yeah. system if you think about it. And that's, that's, but it's hard to control because you got these two crazy voices in the fight. The one voice wants to finish it right away. And the other voice says, no, 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 take your time. Relax. Don't, don't over, don't go too fast. You got 30 minutes fight, you know, and this body is hurt. So bring his hands back up. That's my very first fight. Oh, that was the first one. Yeah, the first drop. This last knee, oof. That was, that's what it broke his nose. You can tell if they zoom in. Oh out. my God. Yeah, yeah. Watch his face now. You'll see right away. Right, oh right, my right. God. Yeah, and I broke his both cheekbones. It's not, I was, yeah, I was getting very angry. Wait, is the, and he kept fighting? Yeah, he kept going. We all see me in a little bit breathing completely wrong. This is actually what I use as an anti promo for me, so to say, because I breathe so bad. But then watch the last knee. That's like, uh, I dropped him like four times. He kept getting. Kept getting up and the audience, food. Now, I go, shut up. <laughs> you know I, mean? I was getting tired. Look at me, breathing, my yeah, shoulders raising. Yeah, shoulders going up. Yeah. But watch Disney. Not oh. this, no, the last one. This is like, I'm going to, no, this not, he's got another eight count here. You see, still breathing wrong. This is yeah. literally what I use in, in promos now. This is not how you breathe. And he's to the audience like, whatever, I'm going to do, go again. Did yeah. he get a different? Did he he owned part of it? Yeah, campus, right. Yeah. Now I think, boom, it's gonna come somewhere. I think no, that was. I mean, you're hitting him so fucking oh, hard. Oh, my I, my bruises on my knees and my oh, this one. Oh, that's, the, that's it. Fight's over now. Oh my god! But this is where I grabbed him by the hair. 
And I just, because it was legal. Yeah. And I just drilled my knee in his face as hard as I could. During the fight, he's only oiled up. So I would slip out of things. Really? And you see me during the fight, he's in my guard. And I start rubbing my wrists on his on his uh, chest. So I put oil on my own wrist. And he looked at me. I said, oh, you're going to feel what I'm feeling, dude. I'm going to do the same thing to you. Yeah. That was crazy. How they much said, money did you make for that fight? Do you remember? <clears throat> I had a good, at the time, a good contact I had for... Three five forty thousand dollars a fight. You have to understand at the time sixty thousand was the was three fights in the UFC. Really? Yeah. So Hoyce Gracie won sixty thousand dollars fighting three times in one night. So for me to get that contract, because after I beat this guy, oh I didn't have it there yet against him. But after this, I had only one more fight, mm -hmm. who I also won, and then I got renegotiated. And now I could ask what I wanted. So I remember what I said. I wanted ten thousand dollars a month. If I, in January, get an injury and I can't fight a whole year, you're going to have to pay me $10,000 a month for the rest of the year. Because for me, that was my biggest fear, to get an injury and not be able not to get fight. money. Yeah. And they said, yes, they had to. And then I was, oh, good. And it was for four fights, actually. But I, one fight was against Guy Metzger. He had a car accident, nothing serious, but he couldn't fight. So now it was for three fights. You see, they still had to pay me. And that year for me was one of the best years ever because there was no pressure. If I get injured, no worries, I got money. Oh, no, all that stuff they need to do right now, the social media, though, I'm so happy oh. I wasn't in that time. So much more relaxed for us. Yeah. I mean, you go up, you did a few interviews and that was, we had a weigh-ins in the UFC, it was in the, in the, in the hotel room <laughs> with, the, with your opponent and his corner, my corner, that was it. Now you got 7,000 people. Yeah. At the weigh-ins, yeah, it was a whole different animal. Who it was you... legal in three states when I was fighting. It was it was only legal in three states. Yeah, it yeah. I remember like John Alabama. McCain said it was human cockfighting. Yeah, who who flipped right away? By the way, right like, later on when the rules came, he said, "Oh, dude, this is awesome." He loved yeah. MMA. Yeah, so that was a good promotion for the UFC when he came back. Uh, McCain. Who I do you say. see? Who do you see fighting now that you go? That guy would have given me problems. Oh, and like a lot of guys. For real? Know? Yeah, but the thing is this, like I was good on the ground, I was good on my feet. Uh, my wrestling always sucked. But that was that's why I was so good on the ground. That's what actually also, I think, saved my career, make it a little longer because with wrestling, the most injuries happen in training. People blow their knees out. I never had that problem because I yeah. wasn't doing it. Rogan's had neck neck and back problems. Us for wrestling. From, from jujitsu. Jujitsu, yeah, yeah, okay. But jujitsu is still controlled if you got with good guys yeah. that you know. But you know, and, and Joe won't make that mistake, like training with an, an, an unknown guy because people are douches, you know? It's, let's see if I can hurt him. You know, that's how simple really? people are. Yeah, being very relaxed and then suddenly go really hard. Oh, I have many guys like that. You know, but then, yeah, the payback <laughs> is also good. <laughs> oh yeah, once that starts, <laughs> oof. You get, that was the first, but that's how I got the job. The guy really tried to hurt me. And I said, dude, stop. They're just filming. They yeah. just want to see technique. No, Wait, we, for, for what? For what? No, for Pancras. Oh, for, for the audition. Oh, for real. And then we started again. He went harder again. I go, dude, listen, it's okay. If you want to go, go. But there's not going to be one way traffic. I'm going to do it back. Yeah. You know, because I get angry. And then, of course, he tried to knock me out, but I just blast him with a kick, high kick in the face. And he needed a bunch of stitches. And there was Funaki and Suzuki. They said, oh, we want him. That was it. That's how I got the job. That's crazy. Yeah, it was really wild. So who do you see in who do you see fighting now that you're really impressed by? And do you follow UFC as much? Yeah. As well, I, I, I'm very busy, but I like John Jones. I think he could be the John one of the Jones greatest ever. So fun, I yeah. mean, yeah. If he, oof, the guy's is good everywhere. Uh, I like it, but everybody. I mean, I, I, if you look at all these fighters now, they know it all. Yeah. Like in the early days, I was the guy with the gas tank. Mm -hmm. You know, and a lot of guys didn't simply come in prepared. So I would have trouble maybe the first four minutes, but they start running out of gas and I would just blast them, you know? So the now everybody is in shape. Yeah. Now you got a guy, like heavy, I fought heavyweight. You think I'm going to fight Engano? <laughs> 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 who, who cuts down to 265, yeah. probably on the day of the fight, he's 280, yeah. you know? And I'm like, 210? <laughs> yeah. And he's got technique and he's got stamina. Dude, that's, that's scary, you know? They need... They needed 230, they did a cruiserweight. That's what I always said for a long time already. Yeah. Because the leap from 205 to 265, it's just too big. I think it would be cool for a John Jones too to fight, the, then he can fight heavy and he can fight cruiser. How much John Jones weigh? Well, now I hear it's like 240. Oh my God. Dude, that's gonna be scary to see him fight. Who's gonna beat him? I mean, if you look at him, I, I, he can do anything. Yeah, he's he's Great. and his both his brothers are in uh, in That's the NFL. That's a freak family, man. Like, that, and I'm talking that I mean that in a good thing. Yeah, high level athletes, all of them. Here, look, 
255. That's so scary. 255. Yeah. 255 and he and he and he moves like he's 150. That's what I mean, you know. He's uh Yeah, it's cool. About I, the I, same weight. I, I, I mean, John Jones. <laughs> yeah, he was 205 at the time. I said, well, if I would fight now, I would probably fight at 185. God, John Jones is insane. Yeah, that's it. You know, if uh if he stays now outside the ring also, good. I and I, I believe you will. Then he can be such an example for kids also. Yeah. I mean, being that good. I mean, he never lost, right? The Hamill fight that he lost, but that was not really a loss. Yeah. The elbow, I think it was legal, but somebody made it illegal. Um, so he's kind of undefeated in my eyes. You know, it's a very scary guy. But then I look at the lightweights so we got. Look at all these guys. Adesanya. I mean, and Pereira. I, I mean, everybody are. I mean, Amanda Nunes. I don't want to fight her. I uh, know. No, <laughs> I saw St I saw Stylebender fighting. Uh, he was just doing a something a warm up. Yeah, uh, with the guy, and I, it looked so intense. Yeah, and I was like, I couldn't do any of that. Like it's so so crazy. I think, and you're the you're one of the one crossover guys who's experienced it. How many people think, oh, I can fight yeah. versus? Oh, you can't fight at all. They 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 come like Shevchenko, by the way, also unbelievable. They come into the gym, and my friends say I'm a good street fighter. I probably can do it, and then they get schooled by seventeen year olds, yeah. and they'll never come back. And the ones that come back, though, most time they will make something out of it, because they can leave that ego behind, you know, and then say, Hey, I need to learn it. That was me, because I didn't want to. I got schooled so bad. Yeah. My first grappling class. I remember driving back. I had one of those first cell phones from Philips, all the way back. No, like battery power for a talk hour, like 30 minutes, you yeah. know, that that's the power you had. It was a stupid thing. I remember calling my wife. I said, listen, I'm parking my car next to the, the freeway here. I'm going to sleep. I said, I'm messed up. I had to eat liquid food for like uh, three days because my throat, I thought I could hold all these crazy freaking throat uh, crushers and yeah. I was just fighting everything and I couldn't eat food anymore. I was so destroyed. And then my wife started laughing. She goes, okay, so that's your uh, free fighting experience? I said, no, I'm gonna go back within six months. I'm gonna tap the whole school, you watch. And I did. <laughs> so. It's interesting, that it's interesting because you've had a mentality that I think people are trying to promote now. Like what you, like when you talked about Jordan Peterson, yep. you, you've had that mentality your whole life. Yeah, You've always kind of lived with that. And then when you, when, the, when you first saw Jordan Peterson, were you like, that's what I was thinking. Yep. Yeah, he's an interesting dude. It's, you know, it's also the things that I had to do. Like if I, I, I was one uh, story up, if I had to go to the restroom with an asthma attack, that was, that's going to be an hour, 15 minute experience. Yeah. Going down the stairs, that's pretty easy. Two, three steps, sitting down, <laughs> going back up. Ooh, whole different animal. That was just a pee. <laughs> you see? And once you get introduced to that, you know, and you have to do it, you have to do it. Whether you like it or not, well, you have to, otherwise you can't, you know? Yeah then I think that it set me up for everything else in life. It was very easy for me to push all the time as hard as I could. People say, do yours. I overtrained myself, Bert. Um, I did, I trained every day, two times a day, as hard as I could. And what I was, was doing was two times a day, on a back, 12 rounds, full power. And I thought that was good, because the more I trained, the stronger I get. It wasn't. So I literally passed out and they opened the gym and they woke me up. I go, what happened? I was 4% body fat, completely crushed. Took me three months to get out. I went to the doctor and he said, well, how much you train? I go, every day, two times a day. He goes, dude, that's the dumbest thing there is. He said, the way your body works is like, you break down your muscles and then you give them rest and prote protein and then they grow, you get stronger. They, it builds it back stronger. If you take one day off and, and like a middle day off, you're gonna be so strong with the crazy schedule that you have. You watch, boss. You're gonna be way stronger than you were before. It took me first a long time to get out of that because I was I was broke. Yeah. And then when I started training again and taking my rest in between, dude, I did nine one on pull ups at the time. I was really freaking strong. Holy shit! You know, and not using, but because people always go, oh, he's probably using steroids. He was using steroids. I said, well, I'm the same weight now, so. If I was using steroids then, I have to be using steroids now. Yeah. I'll take any bet. A million dollars I'll take. Uh, you can test me for six months every day, blood test, not even pee test. Let's yeah. go accurate you know, and see if I gain or lose because I know I don't. You see, so I was just freaking genetic. My brother's the same. My father is the same. Really? We're all athletes. So, you know, just like I love my, like Bianca, the girl here, she's a freak too. She's very strong. Yeah. yeah. Well, you get, some people are blessed with superior genetics. 
and they just are they're, they're just always going to be able to do I remember this kid Mike Angelitas was just, that, that I grew up with was just always ripped and jacked and yeah. never lifted weights and you're yeah. like no that's just how he is but you know it's like when you said yesterday you push with your foot I can do that three times a day I won't gain what I can eat whatever oh, I oh, want yeah, yeah, three yeah, large yeah. pizzas doesn't care I wish I will not gain I wish. It's the wildest thing. And then, this is the craziest thing. If I'm sick in the week in bed, I don't lose weight either. <laughs> How is that even possible? Jesus. I don't understand. Yeah, really weird. It's really weird. Good God, that's crazy. Do you have any lasting injuries? Like, what? how's your body everything is, Everything's good. Uh, all the injuries I have is actually from, like, movies and TV shows and oh, fight scenes. Yeah. I have, like, neck injury. Like, as you can see, my arm is all atrophied here. Yeah. Well, there was, I couldn't pull the trigger from a gun. That's how bad my hand was. So going from the 9-1 on pull-ups to not able to grab a cup of coffee, that freaked me out. So this actually is big now. Like this, you almost don't tell, but you see it now. But this, like this here on the bottom, was my whole arm. Oh, for real? Yeah, it was really weird. What was that? Is that from a pinched nerve? Yeah, nerves. So they stop firing to the muscles, and then it stops. So I have four neck surgeries. I got plates in the front and the back everywhere. Then I have my kneecaps, no, no cartilage on my kneecaps. I think that happened with something. I did a different training. I'm not certain, so I don't want to mean, uh, mention that because if it's not case, that it's going to give him bad promotion. But I used, yeah. used a certain device that I believe scraped the, the, the cartilage of my kneecaps. Yeah. And that's painful. It doesn't do anything, and there's nothing you can do. Oh, People God. say, oh, that's a kneecap. It's easy. It's the worst one. Every doctor will tell you. It's not like you pop the kneecap out and put the new one in. It's a tendon. You can't. You have to. They have to cut it in half. They have to drill a plate onto it, and then it becomes weaker. Thirty-five percent. There's a oh chance of breaking God. the knee. You gotta stay away from that. So just learn to live with the pain, and then uh, that's it, I guess. That's fucking crazy. Yeah. How many times have you been knocked unconscious? Never. Yeah, I've been blessed. <laughs> I've been hit with a baseball bat. I've been hit with a Coca-Cola bottle, a big one. Yeah, I had some. I had some. Then I even go like, wow. <laughs> yeah yeah crazy God, that's crazy yeah i had some hard punches though like if you spar guys like think of peter he's or peter Ertz, you know there's moments that you you get hit you go you hear yeah. that sound in your head and you go like that's a good one you know but i could keep fighting so no i've only had the i've only been knocked out <laughs> I've never I don't think I've ever caught a punch and not gone down from it <laughs> oh, it's just... yeah like I, I just uh, well there were always sucker punches that was a big thing in college yeah. for us we're always no one ever fucking fist no one ever like got face to face and fought like that never happened Yeah, it was always some dude Hit punching some guy when he didn't expect it and uh, that happened to me I was suplexed one time onto my head jeez yeah man that on was... the street uh, yeah, well, yeah. And, yeah, in a in a in a pool hall type thing. But still, it's no no mats. No mats. And no even mats. mat suplex is already bad. Yeah, grab me and flip me over, landed on my head. I woke up, I woke up confused as shit. Like, didn't know where I was. And then was it really? I I I don't I don't know like if I, I don't know if I reacted the right way. But like I I kind of just walked out of there and then got my car and started driving. And then I didn't know where I was. Oh. And I was confused. And then I parked <clears throat> my car at some place. And got out and started walking, and I was sitting on a bench, and uh, I walked into the wrong class. I mean, it was so fucked up. Yeah, like, yeah, it's completely. Yeah, and some girl found me and uh, uh, put me in, uh, in her car. She took me to the hospital, and I was like, I I had an accident, a car accident in my wife's car at the time that it didn't have an, uh, uh, you know, like a, a rubber a roof. Yeah, we weren't wearing any seat belts. We got into an. Um, into a spin on the freeway. It was raining. Something happened. I got launched. Shit over the crash barrier. So hill down. We missed every freaking tree on going the way down. Somehow, I see my friend flying back and forth in the car. I grab him, put him in my guard. And the only thing I was focused on was really weird. I was like, don't see the thing. Like, terminator. Don't see that. Don't see that. Don't see that. Don't see that. That was the only thing I was doing. And it would end it upside down in the water area. Now, water starts coming in. I don't know how deep this is. My friend is knocked out. So I have to kick the windows out. The water starts coming in. I'm pulling him up. People come running down. I had nothing. I had nothing. He had like his whole skull open. We had to go to the rest of to the surgeon. People said like, what's going on? The steering wheel was like this in the car. I was holding it. I bent the whole steering wheel apparently. Oh the and we go to the hospital and he goes into surgery. And I go, hey, wait, come back before you go. So lean over. And he leans over and I put my finger under his skull and I go, and the surgeon goes like, what are you doing? I go, 
when do I have the chance to touch somebody's skull, right? I, I will never go to get that chance again. Oh my God. And he's just oh laughing, my, my buddy. He wanted oh to call God. the police on me. Oh my God. Oh, you're okay. <laughs> it was insanity. God. I had a scratch here. I remember we went to the car. My car, the wheels were like this. The whole car was mangled. Yeah. And the guy goes like, how do people in the car? I go, I was driving. He goes, you got no injuries. I said, look, I can scratch. <laughs> you know, oh my like, gosh. I mean, yeah, I have been blessed, man, with crazy freaking stars. And still also not knocked out. And what the funny part was when I pulled him out, I check on my buddy. He's also a fighter. And I made sure he laid on the side. Tongue is out. Okay, everything's good. Let's just wait. He will wake up. People running down. And he starts to wake up. And he stands. And he's all there. Best topic. Go, Leon, you okay? And he goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he puts his hands up. He thought he was in a fight. And I oh, start laughing. Sh- that's I go, great. That's funny. And he goes, what? I go, we're not fighting. We just had an accident, dude. <laughs> yeah. He's like, where are they? Where yeah. are they? Yeah. Oh, going. shit, they ruined your car. <laughs> yeah. Who did that? <laughs> this guy right here. Good yeah. God. How yes. do you think? How do you think you'll go out? Like, how? Wh- what's going to be the end of Boss Rudin? Well, is I it going to go, be a lion or a wolf? I want to go out like my grandfather in my sleep. Yeah, you know, peacefully, and not screaming and yelling like the passengers in this car, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but preferably, yeah, in my sleep. I prefer. Well, we all talk about <laughs> at the moment, and yeah. then go. That would be a great way. I, 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 do you have any fear of death? No, I truly believe this. Uh, we 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 go. It comes, I I one hundred percent believe this is not it. I I notice too many things. I've seen things. I see a curtain flying in front of me. I I see a person walk. I've been attacked physically by some spirit. It, it been I've been I did some really crazy stuff like right in my face. Not when I was drinking or doing drugs or anything. Yeah. Uh, no, we were going somewhere. I do not believe that this is the life, 100%. I mean, once you see a curtain flying up in front of your face against the ceiling, it's like, whoa. And uh, I, I, I thought I chased the guy in the house. So I kept running and there was nobody in the freaking house. And there was, it was very really? prominent, yeah. So, yeah, no, I, I'm not. It's, <laughs> I'm not afraid of that. I'm afraid the way we are going to die, like falling off a building. Yeah. You know? so, yeah, I just don't want to go, I don't want to be dying going, fuck, that was stupid. Yeah, like, yeah. Uh, that's, like, you know, that's, I, I had a friend who was cutting his toenails on a glass table and naked after to get right out of the shower and he it broke and he cut his femoral artery dude and he's and i and he was like i think he was a friend i might have just met the guy i don't remember how the story i, I was when i was in new york and i was there i was being told the story he's a guy we were at dinner with and i remember thinking that's not how you want to die no just cutting your toenails and not thinking it through and you know a story like that and it was not about that but it was paralyzed I was in a, in the store in Holland, and I heard "bak," and somebody and then I heard somebody say, uh, "Whoa, somebody just fell from, from the roof," and I started laughing. I told him, "I say, yeah, Monty Python." Why? He says, "No, serious." And I'm looking at this guy, and he, that, what we heard was he broke his back. That was the, the bang we heard. It was in a oh. wheelchair. We saw him the next time, and you know what he did? He was cleaning his uh, shaving electric shaving thing, and he blew one of these things out, and he climbed over the balcony to grab it, and he slipped. Imagine like that. A friend of mine has his father-in-law. He had a, a flat tube on a ferry, uh, a guy who goes out uh, bicycling, cycling all the yeah. time, and he also he get a flat, and he and he slipped and fell on his back. Yeah, paralyzed. Oh, oh. I have a private friend who was trying to climb, who was drunk trying to climb to his balcony because he's locked himself out of the house Dude. and fell, broke his neck and died. I fell off a waterfall like 15 feet on my back and I thought I broke my back, nothing happened. Yeah, but you see, that's, I thought on the 40, 42nd floor in Kobe that yeah. Frank Shamrock was next to me. I was drunk out of my mind. I thought it was fun to climb outside and to knock on his window. Yeah. And there was a railing like this. My foot was completely over and I had to break a security tag for the... And I'm breaking the freaking thing. I open it up and I start going to the side, knocking on the window. They open the curtains and it's two Japanese people, a couple. And I go, oh, 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 whatever. Go man aside, go man aside. Sorry, sorry. So I go back into the house. But right away, my telephone goes, security. Have you been outside? I go, no, 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 been outside. We come up now. I go, I'm chewing gum, right? So I go, I grab the plastic thing. I start putting little tiny pieces of gum on it. I Put it back over the security, close the windows, jump in bed, laying in bed, and then knock on the door. I go, yeah, yeah, the door flies open, they come in and they look at me and they 
rip it open and they see the plastic and suddenly go, oh, sorry, Mr. Sorry, sorry, sorry. And they left like, oh. <laughs> I, I got them, but dude, I was drunk out of my mind. I have I one. Have slipped. I have one story that I really regret. Uh, in Panama City, I I dyed my hair blonde. I had white <laughs> hair, and I climbed from balcony to balcony on the ninth floor. And I think of that all the time. Thinking, and then you get this. You yeah, you have yeah, that yeah, 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 yeah. Like, oh shit! You're like, oh. My hands sweat, and I. And by I, the way, I have a fear of heights. I don't know why. I, I don't know. I was drunk, and I was like, I was like, God, oh, this is the easiest way to get in my room. My room's locked. I don't have my key. <laughs> only this, nine balconies. Yeah, only nine balconies, <laughs> and I. And it was so close. It was really so close. And I remember going like, "Fuck!" I'd wear a hat the rest of the time because they knew that it was a guy with blonde hair. And I was the only guy with white hair. I got slipped acid that weekend. I got I there I look back at so many stupid fucking things I did. Yeah. Where I go, where I go, I just I I'm I don't know how I made it. I worry for my daughter. Yeah. My daughters that they're gonna do something stupid. You know? That's what you said with writing the book. I was starting to write bullet points and I look at my wife and I said, you know what? And they're gonna do it. She goes, well, first of all, the kids are not twenty one yet, you know. Second of all, nobody's gonna believe this. Because it's it's too crazy. I mean, and then, your life is your life is. It's the same. It's 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 if Forrest Gump could kick your ass. <laughs> I mean, That's really, an analogy. You because I've been called the drunk Forrest Gump, but you're like for like your your adventures are fucking insane. Like you everything you experienced is like, but you have such a casualness to you that like. It all makes sense. The fact that your friend, that you befriend Kevin James, you guys become buddies, and you do, and you do the movie uh, Here Comes the Boom. Yep. And you know, and I mean, just everything is just so. It's weird how that goes. You don't you, you don't seem to be like a guy that puts too much much weight on anything. Like no. you're like you're like eh, yeah, let's do it. Yeah, and if something happens, it happens. There's nothing you can change. You know, you can cry about it. I always say, but what we can do is learn from it. Let's go, keep going. Yeah. Yeah, but it's not going to help you. You can cry, you can do whatever you want. It's not going to yeah. help you. Why stop? You know, it's like, oh well, what if this happens? I say, oh, look, that's my the saying I use the most. We cross that bridge when we're there. Yeah. Because many times, all the things you think right now are not happening. So let it go. We'll oh, come. Wow. My wife did. I I did that really bad about a business deal where I started spiraling out of control. My wife said. You're not operating in facts. You're operating in speculation. Yeah. And all that speculation is going to make you crazy. Let's deal with the facts. You know, 1997, uh, what is the, the that Steven, uh, Steven Seagal is the cook. What is that movie? You remember? Uh, On the boat? Uh, yeah. With oh, Tommy Lee? Yeah, yeah. The, uh, oh, what's that? Uh, Assumption is the mother of all screw-ups. That's the line. My brother always said to me, and that's 100%. That's what you're doing. Yeah. Assumption. You are wrong 95% or more with what you assume. You're never right. Somebody cuts you off, you think it's an ass, you're this old woman. It's always, yeah. you're never right. Very rarely you're right. And that's why I'm saying to people, let it go. And by the way, if the guy cuts you off, who knows he just got a phone call. His wife is in the hospital, his kid's in the hospital. Yeah. Let him go. It could be a freaking Nobel winning physicist, or whatever. You know, couldn't be a stupid guy. If you don't know the situation, let it go because there's nothing you can change anyway. It's going to happen. Yeah. You know, it's just deal with it and, and take it from there. My daughter, Georgia, Georgia is my oldest daughter, and she is extremely wise. Well, as a baby, she was wise. Her and I are very wise kids, but they're fucking morons, but they're they're <laughs> wise kids. Georgia, one time they were going to go parasailing, and I, ch I did not want to go. I did not like heights at all. And everyone was getting bullied into going to parasailing. All the kids were like, we're going, we're going. And Georgia came to me and she was like, I don't know if I want to go. She might've been like 12 years old. She was, I don't know if I want to go. And I said, well, then don't, just don't go. Just tell everyone you're not going to go. Yeah. And so then we're walking to go on <clears throat> parasailing. And I said, or, 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 what are you thinking about? She was nothing. I said, are you worried about parasailing? She goes, you know, dad, I actually don't know what it is. Like, I don't know how bad it's going to be. And I think if I sit here and think about how bad it could be, that I then I'll freak myself out. So I think I'm going to wait until I see it. And then if I see it and it scares me, I won't do it. But if I see it and I think I can do it, then I'll do it. And I went, the fuck? Whose child are you? I've been fucking panicking about you doing it. I've yeah, been yeah. fucking freaking out in my head. I am I am, I am, am the assumption asshole. Like I, yep. everything, everything freaks me out. Even an interview with you, I get I get nervous because I go, well, I don't want to like, I like I, 
like I, I the one thing I was like, I don't want to make him tell stories he's already told because I know that people do that to me. Yeah. And then and I go, oh, that wasn't fun for me because yeah. I'm just telling. So I was like, I was like, I, I, you know, but I I get you get in your head. You can't help but get in your head. That's it. You know, it's uh, what comes out comes out. You know, and it's uh, and some of these stories people knew, but there's a bunch I didn't. And that's, that's just. There's so much to choose from. You have so many <laughs> fucking great stories. I mean, like, you're you're just a wealth of just adventure. Yeah, but also stupidity, right? It's like yeah, but, I, but fun. Like, like yeah. it's not stupidity. It's like the kind of stupidity where you go, if you said to someone different, oh, "We're going to send you to the Ukraine," yeah, they'd immediately say no. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's something about, and I have this problem too. A guy like me and you, where you go, oh yeah, I'm going. Yeah, yeah. Like I'm definitely going. That's going to be. Yeah, it's an adventure. Yeah. We're talking about promoting the movie, and I said, get me in Russia. Yeah. Like I want to promote. I want to promote the movie from Russia. Yeah. The I want to bring a screener to Putin and see if I can get it in his hands. Get me to Russia, <laughs> and everyone's like. You're no way you're fucking doing that. And I go, I don't know. Something about the roll of the dice excites me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something about living life like that excites me. I yeah. don't know. Yeah. No, I, me too. I, I was just, I say yes while I know deep down inside I should have said yes. Oh but because God. I'll deal with that later, right? <laughs> so I say yes. I have a problem with the word no. <laughs> yeah, me too, me too. I go, people, I mean, my people wife. say things and I go, don't even ask me. Like, yeah. cause I know my answer is yes <laughs> and I don't want it to be yes. Yeah. Hey, should we get in a car and drive to Vegas tonight? Fucking yes. <laughs> yeah, Those are the go. best times to go to Vegas yeah. when you haven't thought it through. Yeah. Oh God, man, this has been a blast. I I could sit and talk to you forever. I gotta have you on my cooking show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We I'm gonna have you something. on my cooking show, right. and I want to try out this O2 trainer. Yeah, I'm gonna try it today in the gym. Yeah, and it's. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll go you bring you through it, and yeah. then uh, yeah, you just do it like that. This is. There's a little bit to it, but once you get it, it's you can okay. change it. Dude, it's been an honor to have you in here and, <laughs> and do a podcast <laughs> with you. I, I've been such a fan for so long. Any, I swear to God, if anyone is listening. If you want to hear so much better of a podcast, listen to Anytime you Boss is on with Joe Rogan. Because you guys know each other, and Joe knows half of your stories that are all folklore within yeah, the yeah. community. It's, I mean, I'm literally regurgitating every Rogan interview I've ever heard, because you are a fucking legend, man. You thank are an you, absolute brother. legend. Thank you, thank you. My, my daughter, like I said, she came running in one time, and she says, they're doing the Sleeping Boss route, and that was the first time. You know when you said, "How would it be to to be the sleeping boss, Rutten?" Yeah, and that's literally she contacted <laughs> yeah. you guys, and she says, "Hey, that's my dad." Oh yeah, Maybe dude. You, because we, she's a giant fan. We 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 talked about you last time I did a podcast with Rogan. We talked about Brian Urlacher. Oh yeah, talking shit to you. Yeah, and how what a poor to sit. Do you remember that night? Yeah, it was his brother started it, and then Brian Urlacher came to step up for his brother. So he was yeah. actually he was not really the bad guy. His yeah. brother looks identical as a big guy. Uh, yeah, and then the, but yeah, thankfully the the bouncers jumped in and says, "Let's not do this." Really? Yeah, yeah. The, the, anyway, they told him. He says, "Don't go outside." So, but the, for me, the the fun story about that one was that the next day I got we were doing a fundraiser. Yeah. And the next day I got picked up by this little girl. We had to go play golf or something. So and were I'm, you guys both there for the same fundraiser? Yeah. <laughs> like I mean, pro wrestlers there, NFL, NBA, everybody was there. And really? we got the mixed martial artists side. Uh, yeah. So, and she picks me up, and I'm on the second floor, and we had to go down. And the elevator opens, and there he is, and it's packed. Like the whole elevator is full with him and and his brother, and then everybody. And I go, you guys go up or down? And he goes up. I go, ah, darn, I got to go down. I say, you know what? Actually, it saves me one trip, because I knew if I wouldn't go in, they would say something later. So I go in there, and I'm standing, and uh, everybody's super quiet. Nobody says a word. And I go, uh, did you check out the beach here? We're in Florida. He goes, no, I got, dude, it's a crazy beach, it's very nice, you can check it out. So quiet, elevator opens, everybody gets out, and it closes, and then the little girl picked me up, she goes, you're a psychopath. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I had to do it, I had to do it. Oh, yeah. God. Oh, it's so crazy. It's oh. like also when you know when there's a group of like crazy people across the street. Yeah. I don't, 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 but I stop oh walking God, that, that is, way. And I go, why do is, I do this? Why do I do this? Oh, that is me. I, if there's an itch, I got to itch it. If there's someone who's, I, I've gotten myself in so much trouble. If there's someone talking loud about me, I have to go sit at their table. Oh, yeah, I yeah. am, I definitely, I do not like confrontation, yeah. but I love it in those moments. Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm drawn to it. Oh yeah. my God. I actually saw you, remember, in Vegas, we saw each other when you were eating. 
Yeah. I walked in with my wife, and then I told my daughter, I go, he's sitting right here, but I didn't want to disturb you guys. I didn't know if you just came back from a show doing or something. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, so because I go like, oh, he's sitting right here. It would be uh, great. So when we, we went out, because I think it was closed, you were just, it was it was a nice restaurant, actually, by the way, but it was uh, unfortunately closed. But that was just a, a brush. Just a brush. <laughs> just a brush. God forbid, God forbid me and you go drinking together. <laughs> We That's, should do that one time. We should. <laughs> <laughs> Put some security guards yeah. around it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We, should, yeah we should definitely do yeah. that one time. I can break the rule one time. It's okay. <laughs> <you know? laughs> one time. Just one time. One time. We should film it. Oh. Okay. We Boss, and <laughs> Boss and Bert. Boss and Bert. The BP show. <laughs> oh, one knows how to fight, the other can get hurt. <laughs> <laughs> That's the line. <laughs> Dude, you fight, you're looking for fights with everybody. Yeah. You want to go, man? And I'm just standing behind you the whole time. Take my shirt off. <laughs> <on> the machine. <laughs> <laughs> Boss, I need your help here. Kill him. The Erlocker brothers are unhappy <laughs> with some choice words I said about Brian. <laughs> oh, that's fucking great. Yeah. Oh. Dude, thank you for doing this. You're very welcome. Godspeed, yeah. brother. <laughs>